I'd like to begin this meeting um, this, this afternoon by reading the board's mission statement, which is always included in our meeting agendas. The mission of the Medical Board of California is to protect healthcare consumers through the proper licensing and regulation of physicians and surgeons and certain allied healthcare professionals through the vigorous objective enforcement of the Medical Practice Act and to promote access to quality medical care, the board's licensing and regulatory functions. Sometimes I think we need to understand why we're here, all of those who are engaged in this process. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, and other devices during the meeting. They are using these devices to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. The board welcomes public comments and on any agenda item. And it is the board's intent for the public comments, to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward. You will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers complete a presenter slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. This is voluntary, however. Please give your slips to Ms. Cruz Jones. Perfect. I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make last minute comments. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via the teleconference, please wait until the moderator has identified you and you can make your comments at that point. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you are in queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press star two. Assistance is available throughout the teleconferencing meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. During agenda item two, public comment on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, the total public comment for individuals here at the meeting will also be 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public, public comments on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for the total comment period from individuals on the teleconference line and 10 minutes for those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Business services office staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's <coughs> meeting will run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We plan to end around 5.30 p.m. If you are a member of the media and require assistance or information, please see the board's public information manager, Carlos Villatoro. Thank you. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Cruz Jones please call the roll. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Krause? Here. Ms. Lawson? Here. Ms. Lubiano? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Here. Mr. Warmuth? Here. Mr. Watkins? Present. Dr. Yip? And Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum. <clears throat> Moving to agenda item two, public comment on items not on the agenda. Before we invite the speakers to come forward, I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints 
pending licensing applications or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to members that is outside the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to the board decision being challenged in the Superior Court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. Board staff is available to speak with you about any pending matter. In addition, the board would like to uh, the, would like the public to address the board as a whole and not individual members. Please be aware that public comment during the agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to comments and decide whether or not they want a future agenda item on this topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are being non-responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. If you want to comment on an agenda item, please wait until we get to that agenda item. Comments at this point are for items not on the agenda. So I will begin with the slips that I have in hand. Eric Andrus. Hi everyone. Recently an accusation was filed against a doctor for three absolutely horrific things. Let's hope you guys really throw the book at this guy. First, he failed to follow up uh, to file a fi follow up appointment for the patient. Second, he failed to document the date and time of an addendum to the medical record. And third, he failed to assess the patient's substance abuse. Now, granted, the third one isn't good, but come on, failing to schedule a follow up appointment and failing to put the date on time on a document warranted an accusation. For that, you'll file an accusation against the doctor, but when I submit evidence to you from a doctor that my previous surgeon screwed up my surgeries twice and left me with lifelong medical conditions, you closed my complaint twice. It didn't even make it as far as this accusation where a patient wasn't even harmed. You're going to be hard pressed trying to prove that this isn't retaliation against me for coming here and speaking all the time and that doesn't even count closing the complaint I filed against the doctor that killed my sister that this board closed as well. Or all of the other cases we've been bringing to you from victims who were egregiously harmed and this board refuses to act. Are, you ever, are, are any of you ever listening to the egregious actions we are bringing to you about this very board? Do you think we're lying? Are we just spending thousands of dollars of our own money to attend these meetings just for fun so we can make up stories and annoy you? Do you just automatically discount what we say and take what, we, what your staff says as truth? Or are you two being threatened by Kimberly Kirkmeyer like she's doing now, going around threatening subpoenas on medical board personnel to find out who's been talking to me? It's my understanding that working for the board is miserable as it is now and the employees have to worry about paranoid executives who threaten them because they're worried about them doing the right thing and snitching on them. Remember this, I wouldn't even be here if this board had done its job properly and hadn't thrown my complaint for my sister's death in the trash and then illegally denied my public record requests. You can thank Carrie Webb for that. I know Carrie doesn't like me coming and calling her out all the time, well that's just too darn bad. You all are stuck with me until this board stops pretending to protect the public when you're not and patting yourselves on the back for your 4% disciplinary rate. Let's hear it for the brave whistleblowers. Let's hear it for the brave government employees who stand up to the bullies who choose to do wrong at Amer ex the expense of Americans. To all of the medical board employees in this room and back at the offices, I'm here for you anytime you want to talk to me and will do everything in my power to make sure you're protected from bullies like Kimberly Kirkmeyer and lawbreakers that like the staff attorney, Carrie Webb. You all need to open your eyes to these situations you choose not to acknowledge because we're watching, we're cataloging, and we're reporting. Marianne Hollingsworth.
Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'm a patient safety advocate. I would like to ask you to form a task force to change how you respond to complaints where the patients have died or suffered egregious harm. Our complaints are a red flag that a doctor could be dangerous, and you need to listen to us more carefully with these cases. The reason I am bringing this up is that if you had listened to me about a doctor, a patient would be alive today. In 2012, I filed a complaint regarding Dr. A. Grant Kingsbury because I discovered that he had, been give, he had given my father a cocktail of Risperdal, Haldol, Ativan, and more, all without consent. This sent him on a death spiral. It was reckless prescribing. Your investigator told me in March of 2013 that there would be no disciplinary action, but that, quote, a letter had been sent to Dr. Kingsbury addressing the concerns in the hope that in the future he will establish a better approach in order to maintain the highest level of professional care. I wrote a letter appealing that decision on April 3rd, imploring the investigator to take action so he will not endanger any future patients. So you can imagine my shock and dismay when I saw Kingsbury's name on the death certificate project. On the exact same day I wrote that letter warning you that Kingsbury could pose a danger, your records show he prescribed 120 Vicodin to a depressed patient. Two weeks later, he prescribed another 120. Then two weeks later, 240 more Vicodin and 30 Xanax, even though the patient said he was suicidal. This patient overdosed 12 days later. Because you did not listen to me, because you didn't care enough to heed my warning about this doctor, someone else died. This blood is on your hands. The kicker is that Kingsbury has the arrogance to challenge the decision for a pitiful 35-month probation. Those of you on panel A had the chance to hear his reasons on how the life of a manipulative patient is not worth much discipline. I hope your decision sends a uh, message to Kingsbury, a strong message, instead of a pat on the back. So tonight, when you go out for your nice dinner, instead of laughing over testimony like mine, I want you to seriously discuss how to listen to complaints about dangerous doctors and how a task, for, a task force could help. And later, as you lie in bed tonight, I want you to think about the patient who overdosed after being given 480 Vicodin in one month. I want you to think about how this board failed him and his family. And I want you to think about how you can listen to people when they come to you begging for protection from a potentially dangerous doctor. If a doctor has to be told he needs to provide the highest level of patient care, maybe he should not be a doctor. And if you can't see that, maybe you should not be on this board. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to talk to you later. I gave uh, Ms. Webb copies of the letters both from your investigator and my appeal. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hannah Ree. Good morning, uh, medical board members and executive staff. We, uh, so I'm Hannah Ree, Dr. Ree in some states. Um, so uh, we are Black Patients Matter, and we would like to first state that um, we are so gratefully glad that everyone here has made it to this meeting safely, right? Um, and then pertaining to my um, Bible-based belief, tomorrow, tomorrow is not promised. Um, I know my walk with my Jesus. Throughout my medical career, traveling throughout the United States, visiting patients in their homes, workplaces, shelters, on the side of a dirt road or next to a volcano, um, Having now performed well over 10,000 home visits, I sometimes tell some of my patients, none of us are getting out of this alive. We will all pass away one day. For this moment here today, it is not our time. We at Black Patients Matter would like to first of all apologize, sincerely apologize, because I, I know what it's like to be sued. Um, we apologize for having to file another federal civil rights lawsuit. Okay, look, 
Um, there's really only three things to know about me, about us. Number one, uh, my medical license was uh, revoked uh, by the California State uh, Medical Board uh, for being a whistleblower, a federal whistleblower. Number two, we have filed many federal civil rights lawsuits and met with um, HHS, OCR in Washington, D.C. Uh, regarding these issues. Um, the very first lawsuit that we filed is still ongoing after two years. And in the case of, and, and if there's any question of what we do, our group is called Black Patients Matter, and if it's not self-explanatory, um, we advocate for black health. Um, so please, members of the medical board and executive staff, there's no reason to approach us in the audience to berate, intimidate, bully, harass us, ordering us not to make statements which you do not agree with. At this point, it should be clear to everyone here that Black Patients Matter is relatively predictable, right? So um, there is no other solution except to vacate accusations and decisions which are racially and religiously biased. Um, and look, unconscious bias doesn't work. The individual medical board member that I will not point out um, has had unbiased whatever training and I would strongly suggest for transparency that um, we have an agenda item to review what is this unconscious bias training that's not working. Um, and so uh, we are grateful that everyone is here today. Let's do the best with the amount of time. Um, and uh, we're here to time work. Is up. Thank you. Thank you. Faith Gibson. It's my pleasure to come to my first medical board meeting in 1993 and as a, uh, I, the director of the California College of Midwives to work with the board um, during that length of time, I've, I was appointed to the Midwifery Advisory Council and served six years on the council. And what I'd like to um, suggest or, or request is an opportunity to do a presentation for the board on the practice of midwifery in California. And specifically, I'd like to do it in a kind of like a two-part, like maybe two 12, 12 minutes on two different occasions, one of them to deal with a kind of overall mid, uh, kind of his, the history of midwifery and the conflict and also the areas of cooperation between midwifery and obstetrics, and then to deal with the specifics of licensing in California for midwives, which started in 1917. Um, um, I guess that's about it. I don't really have much more to say. Anybody got a question? I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments on the phone? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name clearly. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2. One moment, please. Susan Lauren, surgical assault victim, your line is open. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Saul Berger, who I went to for medically recommended breast reduction, performed a disabling surgical battery on my breasts and body. <clears throat> In addition, I experienced negative health and contour effects of lipectomy that are verified by scientific studies. Thousands of desperate reviews by people, mostly women, Detail a spectrum of harm caused by adipose removal. They claim they are gaslit by offending doctors who deny, victim blame, shame, gag, threaten, and have inaccurate records. Some complain of assault. The public doesn't know the truth because the Medical Board of California, defense attorneys, insurance companies, online websites, and more cover up harm and protect the offending doctors. Liposuction is unsound based on the biology of fat, it's dangerous, and destroys many lives. I'm going to read the Los Angeles coroner's list of liposuction-related deaths from 1999 to early 2019. This list doesn't even include two people I know of. Morbidity and mortality is not waning. Every person on the list is female. Average age is less than 48 years old. Cause of death by frequency is fat in the bloodstream entering the lungs, blood clots in the lungs, heart attacks. 
bleeding to death, infections, anesthesia complications. 30% were black, 37% Caucasian, 26% Hispanic Latin, and 4% Asian. This medical gender violence against women needs to stop. We need truth in advertising about liposuction, criminal investigation for surgeons who assault people, transparency, patient-approved records, and strict accountability. Uh, the responsibility to do the right thing lies with surgeons and their boards. Now here is the list. Raven McBee, 37. Donna Weintraub, 58. Ann Barrio, 29. Kimberly Wallister, 41. Dolores McCoy, 60. Donda West, 58. Sharon Carpenter, 61. Carmen Penalozola, 57. Tamara Claiborne, 43. Yolanda Angeles, 37. Linda Sherfield, 42. Gemma Gomez, 31. Desiree Williams, 65. Bernisa Sharp, 56. Bet Lai Yim, 54. Toshia Williams, 43. Mari Cruz Elizonde, 42. Rafaela Castro, 40. Adela Barrales Sanchez, 39. Linda Taylor, 70. Susanna Patmore, 50. Margalit Siegel, 77. Alma Brito, 59. I am asking anyone, I don't trust your board because you have not done the right thing. I'm asking anyone that's listening, and I'm asking new members on the board who may bring a fresh ethics to the board to stop this insanity. This is violence against women. You're killing us. You're harming us. It needs to stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Christina. Your line is open. Hi there, this is Christina from A Voice for Choice Advocacy. Before I start, I just want to say it is incredibly hard on the phone to hear the uh, board members speak. Um, it is, it, there's a lot of uh, background noise, and so if there's any way of moving the speakers or the phone apparatus closer to you, it would be much appreciated, similarly for the people giving public comment in the room. Um, it, 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 the live cam is better, but the live cam is about 30 seconds behind the actual um, the actual, what's actually going on. Um, I wanted to bring up again, our organization of Voice for Choice Advocacy has asked this many times, but that there is some form of formal um, various vaccine adverse event reporting training that is done uh, with physicians. Uh, I know that you have put that information in your newsletter in the past, but that some form of vaccine adverse event training is done with all physicians. There are physicians in this state that understand that adverse events happen, there are many, many, many physicians that don't understand and that just believe that vaccines are safe and effective. They're not safe and effective for everyone. And, and even if that physicians believe they're safe and effective, they have to know what the adverse events are so that if somebody comes in with an adverse reaction, they can identify it as a vaccine reaction and report it. Um, the other thing that we would ask for is for um, the medical board to... Um, to give a understanding of what standard of care is or an expansion of what standard of care is. Standard of care currently is defined legally as that 95 or a certain percentage, high percentage of physicians are, that is how they practice uh, in response to symptoms or, or certain uh, disease uh, or something being, being identified. There are many physicians that or there are a group of physicians that are always on the cutting edge of research, that are doing research outside the box, that are doing treatments that are outside the box. And those physicians doing those treatments, for example, if you go to the Mayo Clinic or if you go to St. Jude's, you're not treated with standard of care. You're treated with the cutting edge research and treatment. And that should be included in what's allowed and defined as standard of care treatment or some other form of that, because the medical board is telling our doctors that they have to stay within standard of care, even if they are using the most recent research uh, that is out there. And, and our doctors shouldn't be slapped on the wrist or, or have their medical license questioned if they're using research and, and the most recent and up-to-date medical research. It does take 17 years for something to get in, from a medical paper to a physician's office on average. Thank you. 
Thank you. Alice, Allison Sorrell, Yolanda Seltzer. Hi, uh, my name is Allison Sorrell. I am a parent of a vaccine injured child who has uh, suffered for the last seven years as a result of his injuries. I spoke at the last medical board meeting about the discrimination against parents and children who have vaccine injuries, um, pediatricians unwilling to write needed medical exemptions as per even the new law, um, but currently as the law already stands now. I also wanted to bring attention to some new comments that come directly from the World Health Organization who held a global vaccine safety summit. Um, this was in December, so just uh, a month ago. Um, I hope that these comments will come to mind as this board continues to work on how they will implement SB 276. One of the uh, most alarming comments that was made was by Dr. Samaya Swaminathan. Um, she is a chief scientist for the World Health Organization and a pediatrician. She said, I think we cannot overemphasize the fact that we really don't have a very good safety monitoring system in many countries, and this adds to the miscommunications and the misapprehensions because we're not able to get clear-cut answers when people ask questions about the deaths that have occurred due to a particular vaccine, and this always gets blown up in the media. One should be able to give a very factual account of what exactly has happened and what the cause of the deaths are, but in most cases, there is some obfuscation at the level, and therefore, there is less and less trust in the system. Uh, this is one comment that I wanted to bring up because in my case, my son was vaccine injured. He went into anaphylactic shock. Six months later, he, de he uh, developed multiple different eye problems. And when you look at the inserts from the vaccines he received at his 12-month appointment, they are all listed side effects. Um, my son is eight years old and still deals with many of the same side effects that are listed on those um, inserts. And so when we're talking about the safety of these vaccines, all we are asking as parents is that when we, when a bill comes to you guys and you have a hundred plus people calling in and showing up at your meetings, that you listen to them and you take them seriously because these are our children's lives and these are children who have already been affected by vaccines. And when you guys are a board that are meant to protect patients like us, I would hope that you would take those comments seriously because what we have seen now is we've called several pediatricians, like I said at the last medical board meeting, we've called several pediatrician offices, and they have stated that their policy is that they just do not write medical exemptions at all. Now, I do not know how this is not a violation of patient rights, but I need you guys to do your job in looking into this and making sure that all children have access to health care and quality health care, and if they need a medical exemption, they are able to have it. So when considering how you are going to implement SB 276 in 2021. I hope that these comments come Please into conclude. play. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions in queue at this time. Thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one, unmute your phone and record your name clearly. If you need to withdraw your question, press star two. Moving to agenda item three, approval of the meeting minutes from the November 7th, 8th, 2019 quarterly board meeting. I move. Okay. Are there any uh, public comments in the room? Are there any comments on the phone? Thank you at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones, please call the roll. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. And Ms. Pines? Aye. The minutes are approved. I'm now going to move to agenda item four, President's Report. Um, Dr. Lewis and I have had calls with the executive staff to discuss the meeting agenda and other board projects. <laughs> Since our last meeting, board staff has published the 2018-2019 annual report, which highlights information about the physician and surgeon demographics throughout the state, it provides a breakdown of enforcement cases processed and various actions taken, and details on projects the board pursued. 
Additionally, board staff has been busy preparing and implementing for the new licensing changes that went into effect on January 1st, 2020, requiring applicants, regardless of whether the medical school attended was domestic or international, to successfully complete a minimum of 36 months of board uh, board domestic or international, whoops, sorry. Uh, yes, no, that's correct. Of 36 months of board approved postgraduate training. Also effective January 1st, 2020 was SB 425, which requires health facilities and entities that allowed licensed health care professionals who provide care for patients to report allegations of sexual abuse and sexual misconduct made by a patient against a licensed healthcare practitioner to that practitioner's licensing board within 15 days. Information is available on the board's website as well as a new SB 425 reporting form for health facilities to use. Both changes will increase consumer protection and I would like to thank the board staff for their continued hard work in furthering the board's mission. The board held two expert reviewer trainings in fall of last year in Northern California. The trainings went well and we're eager for the next training series, which will be in Loma Linda. Now it is my honor to present the President's Award for 2020. As part of the board's strategic plan, this honor is this award is to honor an exemplary employee who embodies the board's mission in action. The President's Award for 2020 goes to Board Counsel Carrie Webb. Ms. Webb demonstrates outstanding legal services to the board members, board staff, and consumers daily. We rely upon Ms. Webb to bring a compelling and collegial and fair voice to the complex and varied issues weighing on licensees and on life-changing discipline decisions on physicians. Her integrity, dedication, and excellence and leadership on a variety of consumer protection initiatives make her most deserving of this honor and example to all of us. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Are there any questions or comments from members on the President's report? Uh, yes, oh, so thank you. I just Excuse want to let it go, so. Kerry. Congratulations. Well deserved. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. The work is very challenging, but very meaningful, mm -hmm. and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Webb. You are greatly appreciated. Uh, so uh, in regards to the report, um, we at Black Patients Matter just want to add that um, as far as the expert reviewer training, uh, we're very concerned that um, the uh, medical experts that are utilized by the board have um, no significant uh, train, excuse me, no significant experience experience in um, racial diversity and religious tolerance. And so certainly in the days of old, you know, it's important for patient, for expert witnesses to be board certified or, or that kind of thing or volunteered for the local SWAT team. Uh, but the, in this day and age, it's, it's relevant and important to um, review and to discuss the importance of um, medical experts and consultants to have um, diversity experience, if they sat on a board, addressing racial diversity, um, that sort of thing. And I also want to add that the majority, the majority of expert, experts that, that the medical board utilizes have no experience, no recent experience in treating black patients, none. Whether by choice or by demographics, they don't. 
They come from whites only clinics. Thank you. Thank you. This is hard for me. I think under other circumstances than the medical board, I would be friends with Carrie Webb. I think she's really cool. And I think she's really, really bright. I love that she walks around with her little book and is always looking things up. But I want you all to remember this day because one day I'm gonna prove that she's breaking the Public Record Act law. And I'm gonna come back and remind you because she is. Thank you. Any additional comments in the audience? Any comments on the phone on the president's report? If you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Thank you. Yep. Moving to agenda item five, board member communications with interested parties. Do any members have anything to report? Okay. Are there any comments in the audience? There's not in the report. Any comments on the phone? Oh, you do have a comment. Yeah, uh, just very quickly, uh, maybe we can have a, uh, a, a general definition of interested parties, because um, I, I think we're all interested if we're here. So, um, because then I can uh, share that, um, just kind of defining interested parties versus, you know, communicating with non-interested parties, I don't know. But that would be nice just to have that definition. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's move to agenda item six, executive management report, Ms. Lally. I'm sorry, were there were there comments on the phone? I thought she said there were comments. Yeah. No. no, thank you at this time. Great. Happy New Year, <laughs> Happy New Year, members. Um, please turn to executive management reports under agenda item six in your board packets. I will not review each report in detail but rather highlight items I would like to bring to the board's attention since the last meeting in November 2019. I'm happy to report that the board welcomed Dr. James Nuovo as the board's chief medical consultant. Since 1997, Dr. Nuovo has been such a vital part of the Central Complaint Unit's medical consultant program. He has literally reviewed hundreds of cases for the board. Most recently, he served as a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, Davis, since 2005. Dr. Nuevo's extensive experience is already proving to be a valuable asset to the enforcement program. His initial focus is refining the board's expert reviewer program. He is also advising board staff on policy issues and serves as a valuable in-house resource to us. We are grateful to have Dr. Nuovo on board and part of the MBC team. The first 2020 training for expert reviewers is scheduled for February 23rd at Loma Linda University. Registration for this training and the expert reviewer program is available on the board's website. The board was successful last year in increasing the hourly rate for expert reviewers who complete the training and provide a satisfactory sample report. The hourly rate for case reviews increased from $150 to $200 and testifying from $200 per hour to $250. Staff are making a concerted effort to have all experts trained this calendar year. Next, wanted to give a quick update on the executive director recruitment. Um, as you know, the executive director recruitment announcement was approved by the board at the last quarterly meeting in November. The deadline for applications was set for December 13th and then was extended to December 30th, 2019. The recruitment announcement was advertised in the Capital Morning Report and also shared with numerous state and national organizations so they could then disseminate it to their networks. Working closely with DCA's Office of Human Resources, the selection committee held the first round of interviews earlier this month. 
the candidates recommended by the selection committee will be interviewed by the full board in closed session tomorrow on January 31st. On January 1st, as President Pines mentioned, the postgraduate training and licensing requirements for physicians and surgeons changed. All applicants, regardless of whether the medical school attended was domestic or international, are now required to successfully complete 36 months of postgraduate training. Applicants will need to complete 24 consecutive months of training in the same program in order to be eligible for a physician and surgeon's license in California. Additionally, a postgraduate training license, which we refer to now as the PTL, is now required for all residents par participating in an ACGME accredit accredited postgraduate training program in California in order to practice medicine as a part of their training program. Any resident participating in an ACGME accredited postgraduate training program at the time the law went into effect and who is not eligible for licensure will need a PTL by June 30th of this year in order to continue in their training program. The new PTL applications are available on the board's website and they're also available online through the BRIS system. To date, the board has received 215 PTL applications. The licensing program, um, the management and staff continue to work with applicants and programs on questions regarding the new requirements. In addition to the postgraduate licensing changes, the licensing program also successfully launched a new direct online certification submission, or as we're calling it, the DOCS portal, with three medical schools. The new portal allows the board to electronically receive documents, verifications from medical schools, and postgraduate training programs. This automation will improve our customer service and as well expedite license processing. Staff will be onboarding all remaining medical schools and accredited programs by next month. On the topic of technology, the board's mobile alert app for Apple iOS devices has been downloaded by nearly 11,000 consumers. The board's IT staff anticipate beginning enhancements by the middle of this year that will provide additional functionality to this mobile app. Once the enhanced functionality has been added to the iOS version, IT staff will be able to fully focus their attention on replicating that functionality for Android devices. I want to share with the board a very important um, uh, item that came to the board's attention and information that we've put out to physicians, um, all licensees in the state recently. The board has received reports from physicians that they were receiving extortion phone calls from people posing as DEA agents or medical board staff or investigators. And the physicians were receiving messages that they were under investigation and they were being um, asked for money. The board sent an email blast to licensees and physician organizations throughout the state, um, also posted it on social media, alerting physicians to the scam and how to report these fraudulent phone calls. The medical board and DEA will never contact physicians by phone to demand money or any form of payment, nor will the board or DEA request any personal or sensitive information over the phone. Reporting scam calls will greatly assist us in investigating and stopping this criminal activity. And again, for more information on how to report any calls that physicians may receive, it is available on the main page of the, of the website. Next, I wanted to update the board members on the board's budget. Governor Newsom released his proposed state budget for fiscal year 2020-21 to the legislature on January 10th. The board's fund has been updated since the last meeting to reflect changes made during the governor's budget building process. A copy of the fund condition is in your board packets under pages 6A, 7, and 8. The board's fund is at 2.1 months reserve at the end of fiscal year 1920. By next fiscal year, the board will be at 0.3 months reserve. The fund includes a proposed control section 14 loan. This is a loan between the Department of Consumer Affairs, special funds, and the board. 
This loan adds $8 million to the medical board's fund in next fiscal year 2020-21 to ensure the board has enough cash flow to continue operations until a fee increase can be secured. The board must pay back this loan within 18 months and that includes with interest. As you know, the board has a statutory provision that it must maintain between a two and four month reserve. With the current fund product projections of insolvency by early next year and expenditures continuing to outpace our revenues, the board will need to pursue a fee increase immediately to cure this structural imbalance. This imbalance cannot be cured through cuts. Additional revenue is needed. The last initial license, licensure and biannual renewal fee increases were implemented in 2006, which is 14 years ago. The initial licensure fee and the biannual renewal fees were raised from $610 to $790. This equaled a 29.5% fee increase. Last fall, the board contracted with CPS HR Consulting to perform the required fee study to determine the appropriate levels for licensing fees for the board to conduct its business at a service level that is efficient for licensees and ensures public protection. CPS held a kickoff meeting with board management and has had numerous meetings and phone calls with staff over the past months. CPS will provide their recommendation and details regarding why a fee increase is necessary during their report to the board during the next agenda item, agenda item seven. But in short, in the past 14 years since the last fee increase, the board has experienced minimal revenue growth and significant expenditure increases. The cost of doing business has considerably increased in 14 years. And almost all of the significant cost increases have been recent and outside of the board's control, quickly eroding the board's reserves. The board will need to take action today to pursue a fee increase to cure the deficit and give board staff the authority to seek legislation to increase the board's fees in law. Any legislation passed this session will, uh, won't take effect until January 1st of 2021. Finally, I would like to conclude my report honoring a dear friend and college, colleague of the medical board, Renee Threadgill who passed suddenly earlier this month. Renee dedicated 36 years, yes, I said 36 years at the medical board until her retirement in 2014. She deeply loved the work of the board and mentored so many, so many of us along the way. Renee will be remembered for her quick wit, her extreme humility, always being an example of grace under fire. And I think all of us would agree mm -hmm. her expressions. <laughs> I think Renee defined if looks could kill. <laughs> uh, and I can only imagine the look she's giving me right at this moment because she never liked any attention or accolades. So she, I, can, I can already feel her right now. Uh, Renee changed this board forever and, and that's the truth. And she will never be forgotten I would ask that we pause for a moment of silence to remember the extraordinary life and service of Renee Threadgill. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, this concludes my report and if there's any questions from the board, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Ms. Lally. Are there any questions from the members? Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, Christina, I'm puzzled that only 200 plus people applied for PTL. There are thousands of residents in the uh, state of California, so let's make sure that all the programs get repeated information. Most definitely. Any other comments from members or questions? Yeah, just one yes. question. Um, on the I saw on the statewide expenditure, there's a four million, is that an increase? Um, let me get to the fund condition. I'm sorry, um, statewide so, pro rata? Yeah. So um, that is the pro rata that we pay for our state services. So 
Um, we get our paychecks from the state controller's office, treasurer's office. So that's what we pay for our state services. Um, and yes, in last, uh, in 1819, that was 4 million. In current year, it's 3.7. Okay. And then projected uh, for the governor's proposed budget, 3.3. Dr. Lewis? Just um, again, could you tell me or tell the, could you tell me or tell the board the time our period will be insolvent um, by the end of fiscal year, or if we don't have a fee increase, when would be, we be insolvent? We're looking at um, insolvency. I mean, we will have the section 14 loan, um, so that will um, keep our budget balance, um, but without a loan and without, you know, long-term fix to this with the fee increases, we would go insolvent um, the beginning of next year. And the uh, loan would bring us to how many months um, of reserve? Um, really, it just balances our, our budget and gets us through um, this. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It, it just makes us even. Even. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, so the loan was just like a Band-Aid in the mean? A very generous one, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not generous if you're paying interest. <laughs> <laughs> right. True story. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from members? At Dr. Kananadev? Yeah, I do have uh, questions, but I want to hear the item seven. Uh, yes. I'm, sure. Okay. I'll bring it okay. Any comments from the public? Uh, yes. Hello, Dr. Ree here with uh, Black Patients Matter. Um, you know, I rather than have a fee increase because the the fees in California are high compared to other states, and of course uh, we know that. Um, Black Patients Matter calls for a reduction of the medical experts. Why do we need 800 plus medical experts, especially the ones that I personally have experienced who failed um, to retain his uh, family medicine um, board certification? Um, we have hired guns who only uh, testify on behalf of the, the state. Uh, they don't testify on behalf of the physicians. They're one-sided, they're biased. Um, and so we call for a reduction. Let's look at where we can cut back, cut back, because increasing the fees is, would be another Band-Aid. It seems that with 800 medical experts, um, you know, the medical board is not a company that hires employees or produces any type of goods. Um, it seems to us that if the majority of the medical experts and consultants um, don't have experience in treating um, underrepresented patients who have a higher morbidity mortality rate, um, then we, we don't need them. We need to focus on the quality of dollars we use and not keep increasing uh, the fees or having money borrowed to us or whatever that situation is with the high interest rate. So um, we, we call for a reduction, reduction. Um, there's too much money going out to the executive uh, committee side of it um, with these medical experts who take so much time in getting a case open and then over to the AG's office um, trying to make a circle fit into a square. So um, thank you. Thank you. It strikes me as odd that these staff reports often really focus on good things that are coming out of the medical board. It seems odd to me that you don't often report on things that really are bad that happen at the medical board. Like there was never a, a report at one of these meetings about the supervisor who raped one of your employees and you guys have a lawsuit against them. Why aren't these things ever talked about in the president's report? Um, as far as the uh, the uh, number, how eleven thousand uh, downloads on the, the the app that you all <laughs> like to brag about so much that most of the advocates just think is awful. Um, that's not a relevant number. 
We all have dozens of apps on our phones that we never open. The relevant number is how many people are using the app? Because we're still having a lot of trouble with it. And Marion can talk a little bit more about this, but that we get we we know of doctors that should be getting an alert on, on the app and they're not coming up. And sometimes we'll open it up and then 14 will flood through. So there's still a lot of problems with this app that you guys like to brag about. Later on in the in the agenda, there's a thing talking about 66 regional public outreach events. You guys know I monitor this board so closely. I didn't hear about one regional event. Who, who are you advertising these events to if it's a public outreach event, if I don't know about it? And you're putting it in, in, the, in the newsletters and things like, oh, look at us. We have all these regional events, but I've never even heard about them. I didn't get invited to any regional events. I recently, the public, the Patient Safety League has now taken to, we hear about all these doctors who are getting in trouble in the news, sexual assault, killing patients, and then we look them up on the medical board website and there's nothing there. So we put it on our website. How, how many of you have been to our website? We have a lot of really good information there. We put news reports, we put court documents, all on our website, it's not on your website. So recently I filed a complaint against a doctor, which I won't name because it's now a pending complaint, um, and I got a message, an email from the investigator assigned to the case who said, hello, I'm assigned to the complaint you filed with the medical board against Dr. So-and-so. Can you provide additional information about the lawsuit, civil court case number, patient name, etc.? It's all on our website. She didn't even bother to Google the doctor's name before she contacted me. Is this really the competence of your investigators that they don't even do any investigation before they try to get information? All she had to do is Google. It'll come up right at the very top. of If you put his name in, our, in, the, in Google, it comes right at the top. Our, our website now hits at the top of these doctors' names. That's just inexcusable. She didn't even bother to Google this doctor's name, and she relied on me to provide the lawsuit information, which is available on the court website. What is with your investigators? Seriously, these are issues you should be talking about in the president's report, not just the good stuff. Tell us about the rape case. Tell us about the supervisor at the medical board that raped, raped one of your employees. Why don't we ever hear about this stuff? Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no phone, so no questions in queue at this time. Okay, moving to the next agenda item, which is item number seven, presentation and possible action on a fee study, Mr. Atkins. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Atkinson. I'm a senior consultant with CPS HR Consulting. And my name is Paula North, and I'm also a consultant with CPS HR Consulting. Thank you. So we are here today to present the results of the fee study we conducted with the medical board. Today, what we're going to cover is the background, uh, background project object objectives and scope, uh, the revenue and expenditure analysis that we conducted as part of the fee study. And then we're going to dive into spe the specifics around the methodology in terms of how we identified the needed revenue for the board to maintain solvency, as well as the specific fee levels that we're proposing. So he here's the big picture background in terms of, uh, and Christine covered a little bit of this already, but essentially since the last physician and surgeon fee increase in January 2006, the medical board has experienced significant increases in expenditures while revenue has remained relatively stable comparatively. The majority of these expenditures have been outside con the control of the medical board. And financial data uh, projects that for, we'll have insufficient funds outgoing into, um, starting in 21-22. So we were engaged to perform an analysis of, we looked at 22 of the different fees across the board, and we looked at um, how to achieve the additional revenue needed for the board to maintain its solvency. So here's a big picture look at what the trends have been in terms of revenue and expenditures. We'll first focus on um, 2006-07, 2007-08, 2007-09, 2007-10, 2007-11, 2007-12, 2007-13, 2007-14, 2007-15, 2007-16, 2007-17, 2007-18, 2007-19, 2007-
to FY1819. So as you can see here, revenue has maintained relative, been relatively stable at about 50 million per year, all the way up to close to 60 million in 1819. That equates to only about a 1.5% annual increase. Contrast that to the expenditures, which were around 45 million in FY 2006-07, and have only grown to um, and have grown to about 65 million in FY 18-19. This represents um, a 3.8% increase. So essentially, the expenditures have almost doubled the pace of what the revenues have been um, since 2006 to 1819. Going forward into the future, the um, projected revenue is, is projected to maintain relative uh, stability, whereas the expenditures um, are greatly outpacing the revenues into the future. Uh, it's projected that uh, currently in 2021, expenditures will be at 80.4 million to grow to 94.2 million in FY2425. So now I'm gonna highlight some of the specific costs that um, have been the primary reasons as to why the expenditures have greatly exceeded the revenues. So the first three areas we're gonna be looking at uh, have to do with enforcement related costs outside of the medical board's control. In FY1920, uh, the medical board's attorney general's budget allocation increased by 4.9 million from 12 million all the way to 16.9 million in FY 2021 due to the increase in the AG's hourly rate. Going forward from 2021 to FY 2425, the projected budget, budget is expected to increase from 16.9 million all the way to 21.4 million. Next, the Division of Investigations, HQIU, in uh, 1819, it went from 19.6 billion to 28.3 billion. Um, and this resulted in a projected annual increase of about 6.3%. Next, the Office of Administrative Hearings in FY 1819 was 1 1.6 million. And we've projected an increase of 2.7 million in 2024-25. Uh, this equates to an annual increase of about 11.5%. Next, employee compensation and benefits has uh, projected to significantly grow, all the way from 15 million in 1819 to 23.8 million in FY2425. So this results in a projected annual increase of 9.8 percent. Yeah. Number the yeah. attorney general's office the hourly rate of increase. What is the assumption there that you made in terms of the volume? Is that just a uh, average? amount of hours that you took, that we are currently spending over, the, did you take a four year period and average it? So that's, it's more uh, related just to the, the budget. Um, so these numbers, we didn't necessarily calculate ourselves. They were budgeted numbers provided. Okay. Next, we're gonna review three additional uh, expenditure increases. So under DCA Pro Rata, was 5.1 million in 1819, and it's projected to go up in 24-25 to 6.7 million. This results in an annual increase of 4.5% annually. Statewide general administrative pro rata in FY 2021 is projected to be at 3.3 million versus in 24-25, it's projected to be at 4.1 million. That projection is about a 5% annual increase. Next, the evidence and witness fees, which have to do with uh, expert medical testimony. In 1819, were 2.3 million, which is projected to grow to, in 24-25 to 2.8 million. This results in an annual average increase of 3.1%. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. huh? You need to use your mic, please. On the report that we have yep. on the statewide general administrative expenses, I'll just work some of the numbers as well, huh? is that in the 2018, 2019 year, that number was at 4.1 million. That's in, it's not on there. Yeah, okay, it's so on, which, the other, uh, on the report? The findings report. Got it, let me take a look. The only reason is we're using a different set of numbers as a baseline now. What, uh, what page are you on there? Like 22? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. 
What was the number you were looking at again? So in eighteen nineteen, the the twenty eighteen nineteen right. number was yep. four point one yep. million. Correct. And there was a in the findings, um, the base number there was two point seven million. If we go to on item seven, page five, the pro rata cost it it it, it identified this as the highest cost, hundred and ninety six point four percent from 2.7 million in 2006 to 2007 and to 4.1 million in 2018-2019. Item G. In Item the G in the agenda? Findings. Findings three. It's page number five on the report that we got. I'm on the fee study that we got. Correct me if I'm wrong. That that's showing over 2006 to 2007 through 2018, 2019. Yes. So it's a little bit different. That's why I'm pointing okay. it out. Yeah. Just so, a summary so, bullet point there that's supposed to be on some different period. Of yeah. Time. So there's two different types of pro rata. I think is what you're getting at. On the report, um, it shows the DCA pro rata. Um, I think is what you're referring to, which is different than the general administrative pro rata. So the, the, the number G is not the same number as that number there. Those numbers do not line up. That's correct, but that they're, they're looking at those over a, a different period of time. So that 3.3, I think actually there's a typo in your presentation here on 2020, 21 should be 2018, 2019, correct? You see, I'm it, not sure. There's something what, well, a little I've, bit off, but but the one in in G is looking at 2006 to 2007. Yeah, I wanted Correct. to get the base number because they they make a claim there that that is a 196.4 percent increase, which is the most increase, which is would make it look like it's the primary, uh, primarily responsible for the growth, hmm. and it's not. It's one small component because that's right. more looks like more the correct figure in there. And, and um, uh, the 3.3 3 in the 2021, that's in the governor's current budget, proposed budget for next fiscal year. So to your point, Ms. Lawson, it's just a um, snapshot. So now I'll dive into more of the specifics regarding uh, how we identify the needed revenue as well as the different fee amounts. So we took a look at the 22 fees that we were asked to, to cover and identified how to, uh, the needed revenue for each fee, which was based upon the expenditures associated with each fee. And the expenditures we broke up into three primary different areas, uh, personnel, operating, and enforcement cost. And we looked at how these expenditures applied to each of the 22 different fee types. We then also considered um, future volume projections, which was based upon a historical analysis we conducted uh, to identify what was going to be the likely fee volumes associated going forward in the future. We then took a look at the, um, the fee levels and then adjusted them by the revenue needed with considerations to that future volume. And the revenue needed was identified based upon achieving a gradual four months in reserve total across the next five fiscal years. So here's a look at the uh, MBC's projected growth budget. A couple items I want to point your attention to. Uh, the first one involving revenues, as you can see, and I pointed out in the other intro slide, the revenues are being maintaining at a relatively consistent rate. Contrast that to the total expenditure volume, which is greatly increasing over the fiscal years. This is ultimately resulting in a negative fund balance beginning in 21, 22, the medical board is just barely maintaining its solvency in 2021 due to that control section loan, which is identified in the transfers right here. And then that loan has to be paid back with interest within 18 months. So that's what these numbers in the red are projected at. So this next picture basically looks at how do we um, maintain the board solvency? What's the level of fee increase that would be needed in order to achieve a gradually increasing to up to a four months reserve essentially? 
So this chart is essentially the same. However, we've included an additional revenue row here that would be needed to meet expenditures and achieve a month's in reserve. So what that results in, that increased revenue, would then result in, um, in 2021, a 2.6 months in reserve going forward. The board is gradually building up its reserves that would be projected to achieve a 3.8 months in reserve in 24-25. Next slide is a big picture look at the different fee levels that we're proposing that would help the board achieve that gradual four months in reserve. So on the left here is the given fee type, and this is in your handout as well. Uh, the fee type, and then you have the current proposed fee and the adjusted fee. So for physician surgeon application, the current fee is $442, the adjusted fee being 625. The percent increase uh, for that particular fee would be $41, which would increase a total of 183 total. So if you're looking at a big picture view across all these different fee types and taking into consideration the volume for each, that arrives at about a 44.9% average increase across the board. Again, the target we're shooting for here is to maintain the board's solvency. This picture right here looks at the current reserve if nothing were to be done, which you can see becomes insolvent in 21, 22. And then the proposed fee increase would result in a beginning balance of 2.6, increasing all the way to 3.8 and 24.25. This next slide looks at the um, how to achieve by fee type the total revenue. And we're just, and this is also in your packet as well. This only takes a look at a couple of the different fees. I just highlighted it for an example's sake. If you take, for instance, the physician and surgeon renewal, we're proposing a fee of 11.50. And then if you multiply that by the estimated volume, you would get the total revenue that would be generated from these two components, right? Just multiplying the adjusted fee times the volume to get the adjusted fee and revenue. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that the uh, projected re revenue for 2021 is not as great as the subsequent years because um, if the fee increase happened halfway through the fiscal year in January, you would only basically get um, half the year with the new fees half the year with the original fees, so your um, total revenue is, is different for, for that reason. And then again, just to point out, these fees would ultimately increase um, the adjusted um, fund balance beginning in 2.6 for FY 2021, all the way down to 3.8 in 24-25. Christine, one, qu one question. What the renewal period is, um, time period is what? Is it? Two years. Every two years. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time, and now we'll take questions. It was a very important overview. Um, so I want to. I think what I want to do is put the motion out, and then we come and discuss and see how we alter the motion. So I'm going to put the motion out. So. I need a motion to approve the recommended fee level increases detailed in Table 13 of CPS HR Consultants Fee Study Report and the Medical Board to authorize board staff to seek legislation to make the necessary statutory changes to the law as soon as possible with the recommended fee schedule. So moved. Are you doing? Yes. Yes, so moved. Second. Thank you. Dr. Gadanadev, I saw your hand first. <clears throat> yeah, I have a lot of questions, but the biggest one is you can't give us the report last night for us to study and really come up with a solution. That makes no sense to me. I never seen a report just the night before coming through, not even a chance to analyze either to me or to the doctors or consumer people, anybody. So that's really uh, very, very worrisome to really go ahead and uh, rubber stamp something. It doesn't, this board is not that kind of board. Number two is that you have only one option you gave, nothing else. There are some costs here which no business can run if the costs go up that way. I understand that they're not probably in our hands, but unless we try something, we won't get there. So you took it for granted. All these costs are going up this high, and then we get this report and we were asking, or 
we are being put on this spot to decide within 12 hours. So that's what my biggest gotcha. issue is. Yeah, and I can address that. So a um, couple things on that, and I totally understand your concern if I was in your shoes. Obviously, it's a really big decision uh, that needs to have a lot of careful review and consideration. Um, just a couple things to note. Um, you know, the medical boards, obviously, they need a fee increase as, as soon as possible. And so um, we were contracted about mid-November. Um, we began work with the medical board, um, which we would need to take into consideration the holiday. You're, so you're about, we probably had about a little over two months to complete the study. Um, and typically for a study like this, we allocate about five to six months. So we did absolutely everything we could within our power to get um, this report out as, as soon as we could. Um, and we did meet all of the established timelines we had agreed to with, with the medical, medical board to deliver this report. So, yeah. When you, when you built this model, the model is built real tight. I mean, we're ending up at 1150 and there's actually no room for anything. So when you got the instruction, what was the parameters that was laid out for you that you based this assumption on? The, the assumptions of this model. Gotcha, in terms of the months in reserve to achieve? Mo months in reserve, was that the only criteria? Well, the months in reserve criteria is, was, was one of the guiding principles in terms of how we decided how much revenue was needed. So with, in statute, medical board only has two to four months um, and in working with the medical board, it was decided that four months would be the target. So after we, uh, so we achieved that with this, but in any eventuality, one lose a lawsuit away, we will be back at two months or, and this could be a repeat situation in a few years if we run into expenses that was not accounted for in this model. Right, and we, we didn't want to, so the projections go out to 24, 25, and at that point, it equals about 3.8 months in reserve. We tried to find the sweet spot in terms of not exceeding that four months reserve, um, but then at that time, if there are additional expenditures hit, that would give enough time for the board to reevaluate potentially another fee increase or to lower their fees or, or whatever would, would make the most sense. And so we really wanted to stay within that, that two to four month reserve going forward, so. And, um I would just add, uh, we definitely wanted to have at least a five-year uh, projection. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we <laughs> aren't we have to do it. back in this position um, in a short amount of time. And then also the five-year reasoning is that would put the board on the sunset review cycle. Um, so we wouldn't be in the position that we're in right now of having to seek legislation this session. Um, so while the board is going through s their next sunset review, they would be able to address fees and, you know, raise them if they needed. Dr. Krause. Thank you. Uh, I know we've been given some data in terms of some comparative licensing fees in other states. I'd be interested to know what the range of licensing fees are within our own Department of Consumer Affairs. Granted, the work that's done for investigating a complaint about a contractor is a bit different from the work that's done for a physician. But on the other hand, uh, we have very similar overheads in terms of cost of the investigator, uh, cost of, uh, of, of uh, staffing. Uh, and it would be of interest to know what that fee range is across the uh, spectrum of the, the DCA boards, uh, and also what the experience has been of other DCA boards in terms of uh, mechanisms by which costs can be held down uh, so as to uh, reduce fees. So Dr. Krause, I just want to make one statement about that. So I, I did ask staff to look at, just randomly pull one that seemed unusual, so the podiatry board their um, initial, initial application fee is $800, and their renewal fee is $1,100, and they only have 2,500 licensees. And there are some comparative data, too, uh, just across the country that we do have um, where this meets right there. So, for example, with Nevada, Nevada's um, application fee is $1,050, their renewal fee is 750. In New York, their application fee is 735. Their renewal is 600. 
in Rhode Island, their application fee is 1,090, their renewal is 1,090. In the Virgin Islands, their initiation fee is 750, their renewal is 1,000. So I sort of give this very divergent area of we know those are small, we know those are pretty large to show that we're not out of the realm in the fee increase we're requiring and some have already been at this fee for a while. So I hope that's a little helpful. It is, okay. but I would also share Dr. Gamanajek's frustration to get a report the night before a meeting. Uh, I'm also concerned that if we delay action that uh, we lose a window of opportunity mm -hmm. for the legislature to act and we set ourselves up for uh, severe problems very soon. Mm -hmm. Dr. Malud? Yeah, there are a couple of things I'm concerned about. Number one, I think board should be very sensitive all the time. For the last few years, we have not raised any fee. Were we not anticipating the costs are going up and we haven't done any action and all of a sudden we are increasing fee up almost about 50% across the board. Number two, have you looked into the thing that go up stepwise instead of bombarding some primary care physicians doesn't make that much and they have hospital privileges and other expenses and kind of stuff to go up stepwise, stepwise like over like six years or something like that instead of just getting them hammered just in first go and creating a lot of uh, problems. And is there a way to cut down the cost or at least where we are in next five years, we should have some limits. Okay, these are the costs we need to cut down and we need to contain our expenses. Um, so I'll leave that to the board. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mahmood, just to address your comment about um, planning. Um, so I would just you know reiterate that fees haven't been raised in 14 years. Um, so the cost of doing business has increased. Um, one of the challenges is maintaining that two to four month reserve. So the board last year, and you didn't have the benefit of that because you joined the board mid-year, um, but the executive director was pointing out that the fund condition was depleting. Um, that fund condition depletion sped up last summer. So where we would have time to um, plan for a longer fee study review period, we didn't have it. So um, one of the contributing factors was the Attorney General hourly fee increase. We were notified of that, that that was in July, that it was gonna go forward um, and be effective in September. Our budget was already built. We wouldn't be able to get any, any more money at that point. Um, the other thing that hit simultaneously was the collective bargaining so um, that means, you know, for the uh, state employees, they had collective bargaining with the unions and CalHR. Um, those were approved July 1st with fee, with fee increases, with salary increases going into effect July 1st. Again, our budget is already set. Um, so when you have to maintain that two to four for a board this size, that's a very, very delicate balance. And the fact that the board has been able to do that successfully for the past 14 years, I think says a lot about this organization and um, the, uh, you know, the, the importance and the significance that we take in, as you said, um, what the physicians have to pay. I mean, we think about that with every decision we, we make. Uh, but sometimes there's decisions in state government that, uh, and you saw it with the fee or the attorney general, um, they needed to raise their costs, so which made our costs go up. Um, also, statewide parada and some other things. Um, when they hit at the same time, our fund it it depleted us quickly. Um, so that's what's led us here today, um, and I, I just want to reiterate that it wasn't for a lack of planning. Okay, Mr. Uh, I'm gonna go here and then I'll go back. Mr. Watkins. Yeah, and you know, to compare this board with any other board is 
not exact. You can't compare. You can only compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. And having gone through these numbers over and over again in the middle of the night, I came to a conclusion that the biggest expense that we are have that is the incalculable. Well, we can't manage it. Is this investigative e expense, right? Yes. We spend a lot of money on this investigation, and then I decided, okay, let's go look at this investigation from where it began. And obviously, I find what is unique about this board that this board does not have. Uh, other boards have. You can have a cost recovery, and that's a, a, a revenue stream, and that's not present in this board. That was negotiated back in 2005 to, to, in order for that fee increase to happen that we do not pursue co uh, cost recovery. What that ended up happening is that the physicians who then have <laughs> litigation with the board, they do not have an incentive to not proceed. Uh, they have an incentive to proceed because they just have to cover the legal costs and they do not have to worry about cost recovery. Whereas with other boards in DCA, and most of it have a cost recovery point. Now, when the explosion is taking place in the enforcement of this, you gotta ask why is this much volume coming through and we spending so much money, we can't maintain the benchmarks for cycle time. You know, our cycle time is twice as long that a case from, in, from it enters into this system till it is like a thousand days. That's like, that's like three years. And every year we have this case and the, the standard the benchmark is 540 days. Now I don't know, someone in enforcement can tell me how we can bring these numbers down. So the root of the problem is greater than us right now. It may look like, okay, we're gonna increase the, the fees at the 1150, but we still be litigating against or a lot of doctors that have, an uh, that have no incentive n not to come and you know protect their rights. But we're spending way more money than them. These, when these costs go up, we uh, this who, if the AG or any other institution, these expenses that just dro got dropped on as the last board meeting, if that happens again, we will feel the pain again, maybe not f in five years, but maybe in three years. So it's not, and I, I feel the 1150 is being very prudent, to be honest. I think this number should be bigger. And you know, the doctors are not gonna love hearing that. But in order to sustain the business, because we're not conducting the business right now as effectively as we would like to. And I would love to hear from the rest of the board about how they feel of that, because that's my observation. Mr. Walworth? I wanted to follow up on, a, on another question that came up earlier. Did we do any kind of study on the effect it would have, we would have if, I believe that was approximately 44% overall increase? Have we done a study on how that would affect our bottom line if we did 11% over four years? That is 11% each of four years. Would we still, would we just delay getting to that, uh, that four month uh, sweet spot or uh, would we still be going into default? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we looked at the fees for each successive year and looked at what would it have to be, say, the first year to make things meet and how that would affect the fund condition. If we did a more stepwise thing, what we saw the fund condition do is like, yeah, we had an initial increase, but then it started dropping to two low twos very quickly. Um, so we looked at each year how the fund condition varied if we did different fee structures. And the one we selected and proposed up here produces the healthiest fund condition as far as continuing to grow without the wavering. So we did look at a few different options, but we were also trying to keep in mind that trying to raise the fees every single year on physicians might get tedious and might evoke hostility a little bit if the fee is raised each year. I agree. 
And so it, this, I understand it's, it's elite, but it hasn't been raised for 14 years. Mm -hmm. and, and you think about that 44% increase compared to the 43% increase in expenditures plus trying to build the reserve, everything lines up. But I know it's a bit of a pill to swallow, but we did look at other options to see what it would do. And I would just add, we do have to repay that loan. We're in that time crunch to repay the $8 million loan in 18 months plus the interest. So that's why we need the revenues to increase as soon as possible. Ms. Mm -hmm. Lawson? Um, just one point of reference, the annual fee every year for lawyers is $544. So by, I mean, it gets close to being mm -hmm. about the same um, thing. State Bar is not DCA, but it's... Um, similar enough. Uh, in any event, my question is, what's the schedule for the legislation? Can you tell us what that looks like and what time frame or t timeline we really are uh, on? Um, well, time frame on our budget, you've seen that. Right. So uh, the board really needs to have legislation introduced this session. Um, and, you know, we would work with Ms. Samos on doing that as well as the um, Assembly Business and Professions Committee likely um, would be supportive. And is there a vehicle efforts? that's already in place? Not that? yet. That I mean, we have What's to wait for this decision. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, has the bill deadline passed? No. Oh, it has it not, has not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the bill deadline is February 21st, and I have talked to staff in Assembly BMP and their chair is aware that they'll be helping us. They might have some bills that are two-year bills that they can move this through in, mm -hmm. but they um, have committed to helping working with us on this. And we really do need to, it to be a committee effort because there's really, I'm going to be honest, no way that I can find just an author to carry this, the standalone. It's going to be um, controversial, and um, so I have gotten that commitment from Assembly BMP committee, and they've identified possible vehicles already, so... Okay. And then, again, any legislation passed this session wouldn't go into effect until January of next year, and the revenue wouldn't be seen until then. Okay. Dr. Lewis and then Dr. Thorpe. Chris. Ms. Lally, um, if uh, we approve it today, we have a motion and a second, then at that point, the board staff needs to run with this and get legislation drafted and written up because I'm hearing people, you know, stepwise and uh, all these different permutations and I don't think that's going to help our position mm -hmm. um, at all. Would you comment, please? Um, yes, time is of the essence and, and I, I definitely agree with the members and I, I hear your concerns, especially uh, making a decision of this magnitude so quickly. Um, having not received the report. Um, we definitely did the best we could to get it to you as fast as we could, um, given our constraints. So um, apologies for that. But the fact remains that the fees haven't been raised for 14 years. The need is there. Um, I mean, the fact that we have an $8 million loan uh, from the Department of Consumer Affairs, that does not happen often. Um, and, and again, we're grateful that <laughs> there is a mechanism for that, but we're in a very um, unique position and we need to take action. Dr. Thor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, so it's clear that, that, that we're gonna need to take action. I mean, I, I understand we're kind of financially, we're in a bind, but the thing that concerns me is that we're structurally setting up for another crisis because we have no control over one, two, three, nine basic functions that we, we have no control over. There are costs that are given to us that we have nothing to say about and there's no way for us to control that. And that's not gonna change. It's gonna get worse as we go on. And even though we increase the fees now, which understandably they need to be increased, and I recognize the difficulty in trying to get the report to us. It is frustrating to make this kind of a decision this quickly, you know, but the problem is, is that structurally this, the system is set up for failure. Because this is just gonna repeat again in two years, three years, because we have no control over any of the expenditures. It's Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> Yeah, so I 
just want to show all of you, take a look at this graph. I mean, if any business runs this way, it's go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. There is no way it can happen. So I, I think it's not just the fee increase. I would like to hear from AG's office and also from HQIU why the costs are going up that high. Mm -hmm. And also I would like to know why you're spending a million dollars for uh, credit card processing and also $5 million for, uh, $8 million for Breeze. I mean, this is what our issue is. It's not the revenue side. I, I think we'll swallow hard and actually agree to revenue increase if you can show us how you can control the costs. And I have no problem if anybody fights with, uh, fights the bill and actually put some cost control measures in it. And also if there is anything to do with the uh, recoupment, I'm okay with it, but we can't be continue to do it. And if we just approve this and do nothing other than fee increase, uh, Dr. Thorpe is right, we'll be guaranteed to be here in two to three years again mm -hmm. to do something. I have a solution. <laughs> Mr. Watkins. Well, you, you, you know, uh, if, if, if we're talking long-range core problem solving, then this is it. If, if, if a lot of the boards in DCA have a, a, a structure that works, and I was sitting on a previous board where we did a fee increase and we did all of this, the numbers worked out, the fees, the fund condition restored, but that fund also, that particular board had a, a cost recovery. And when there is a cost recovery, before someone goes into litigation with you, you will th they will think, is it worth it? But right now, we are filling this system, this enforcement system with so many issues uh, coming from physicians that can, would, uh, at, at random, if, if we put out an accusation, they can defend that, and that's their right. But it is clogging the system. And you, you, all these numbers point to that. You, you've seen all the enforcement numbers from all of those charts. It's, it's right there. And we, then you have to ask, now, where did it all begin? And when you go back to 2005, 2006, the, what we're seeing is just a, a, the, the actual cost of when you put something in place that makes no sense for a board but makes perfect sense for the doctors if you're running an association. That's what the, the core issue is. If you want to correct this, if you want to run this like a business, I, 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 will, I, I will run the numbers myself, honestly, because it is very simple, but we are not in a simple structure. You know, we are in a structure where we have said that the, uh, the language is actually very clear. I can use the same language of SB 231 that was in 2005 where this deal was made. I'm just saying that if you want to resolve this and you don't want to kick this can down the, down the, down the wayside, like Dr. Torp and Dr. Ganadev has said, then let's fix it. But it's gonna start with a fee increase today because we, we actually don't have a choice. Uh, Dr. Yeah. I'm again coming to the same point. If for the last 14 years we had been increasing 5% every year, we would be in a much better position not to take a loan and would have money for the better days and we would not be increasing fee 50% in one year. So that has been done now, but we should still look into that thing. And I totally agree with Dr. Ganadev about these so many expenses and breeze and credit card and other expenses, we should contain them and show our uh, responsibility on that and then increase the fee. And look at stepwise approach. Okay, any other additional? If well, yeah, uh, the. <laughs> gonna talk you, about you, something different than cost recovery. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. We don't totally wanna hear different. that anymore. This is about expenses and revenue. Okay. Revenue is what we have discovered is that we have too much expenses. When you don't have the money, you don't have the money. And we don't have the money right now. So what we have to do is increase revenue, correct? And that's the only option right now. 
uh, we can go back to cost cutting measures post this but right now this is just a simple I got to make some money <laughs> okay just not to sound like business <laughs> Dr. Kananadev you can't get away on this one that easily ah uh, I I just want to float an idea how about along with the motion if you say that in the when we go for the statute, when we go for the law, that we come up with some kind of uh, expense containment and maybe some cost recovery. Uh, with those, I think, I don't think we'll be coming back. My concern is, like, I have a lot of concerns with the, this high going up, especially for the uh, people who work in inner, inner cities or in the rural areas, but more than that, 40,000 of our doctors are from out of state. They don't even practice in California. If they see this fee increase and they just drop, we are in worse shape than we will be. So we have to look at cost containment in statute. You said we can't do anything, but if we are going for increase in fee, maybe we should look at it and see what, how, they will work with all the interested parties and come up with uh, cost containment and cost recovery both, so that way we don't end up sitting here. Maybe I won't be in this board, but somebody else will be looking at it again in a couple of years. So we have sunset review coming, and so I think that's going to be a good time to look at um, what you're um, suggesting to get that into our sunset. Um, Ms. Lubiano? Oh, yes. I, I just want to say that I... I echo my fellow board members' comments about cost containment and that there is a strong need to definitely do something more than just the fee increase. And so um, following up on your point, uh, Madam, I was wondering how with this vote can we put some teeth around an actual, like an action item for the board? You know, would it be a motion, you know, oh. Yeah. So we already have a we already have a mo we already have a motion and a second. Okay. So the challenge with us trying to load up right now, when we have sort of a date certain, we actually have to get to, um, and a process that that's going to go through, is going to further complicate this. And again, we already have a loan. We're not getting a loan. We have a loan, which means we're already in a deficit, and we'll continue to go into a deficit. The numbers are clear. There's nothing cloudy about what we've been looking at. We're uncomfortable about what we've looked at. We don't want to be where we are, but we are where we are. So we have to make this decision. We have to move forward with this vote. We need to let the board staff do what they need to do. And then, as I said, we can then in our next board meeting look at discussing these, how many items did you say, Dr. Thorpe? Uh, nine items that are out of our control. In the nine items, are, do we, can we have some control? Are there three or four that actually we could have some control? And let's discuss what that looks like so then we can work on getting that into sunset. Okay. To, to that end, I would support the motion that's pending and also the direction to staff that we want to have that as our next agenda item. And I think the other thing I would ask is that they come back with a, a plan for what happens if the legislation doesn't pass because I think we need to see what's going to happen. We don't have any guarantee, if I'm correct, that mm -hmm. if we approve seeking legislation for this fee increase that we'll get it. And I think we all know that it's going to be controversial. Um, it's controversial amongst us. It's likely to be controversial amongst, amongst the legislators and stakeholders. Um, so I think at our next meeting we should also see that, you know, realistic or, you know, yeah. uh, reasonable scenario that we're not going to get the increase yeah, that's proposed here. Great. Thank you. This is my final oh. point. <laughs> uh, Mr. This, Watkins. I promise this is the final point. I want to read something. And this was done back in 2005, SB 231. And it read, CMA believes it is more appropriate to recover MBC's cost of investigation to an increase in license fees. And this bill makes, and it was a bill at the time, this bill makes allowances for MBC to increase those license fees to compensate for the loss of MBC's ability to pursue investigation cost recovery from individual physicians. These investigation costs that are so high bleeds out of that. And so it, it, it is only a, a 
right to go back to the source of it and remedy it with the same remedy, even if it's kicking down the can down the street, until we find uh, the, the, a way to manage those nine little issues that we don't have control over. Because those, those, are, those will need much more serious attention than what we can come up with today. Okay, so thank you, is. members. Mr. Atkins, thank you for your presentation. You can return back to your seat now. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your time, everyone. Okay. Are there any comments from the public in the audience? Um, okay, one at a time, thanks. Okay, Hannah Ree. Yes, thank you. I'll try to keep this short. Look, um, so no one, no one, no physician, no body in this room has battled the AG any uh, more than I have personally, okay? So we, um, I personally have engaged them in several lawsuits. And I can tell you right now that you do have alternatives. You don't need the AG to represent you. You can hire an outside firm. There are other choices. And it, it makes no sense. Um, you know, running this as a business would make, it makes great sense. Um, it makes no sense that you have these fee increases that, to which you have no control over. And so um, what's happening is that um, the cost, I mean, the study, what it leaves out, as, as many studies with the medical board, is there's no measured endpoints. Is the increase in fees or the increase in revenue or the increase in cost, is it a good value to implement? So are we getting out what we're putting into it? And there's nothing to show that, oh, it decreases the number of morbidity, mortality, or um, it decreases the number of federal lawsuits uh, made against the board, because obviously it doesn't. I personally, um, I'm a little embarrassed to say that we have cost, maybe in your opinion, unnecessarily a cost uh, to the medical board because of all of our lawsuits and having, you know, you all need to pay for the AG to represent you, when in fact all you need to do is sit down and talk with me and we can resolve it. But that was never brought up because um, that's not how the AG does it. So I can tell you that I've had the most experience dealing with the AG's office and they're expensive. The way they um, choose cases, the way they pursue cases, the way they represent you in federal civil rights lawsuits, they approach it in a way that increases their cost. There's no one else here that can say that except me because I've had this experience. And the HQIU, look, um, as I've stated many, many times before, we cannot continue to fund an HQIU investigative unit um, without understanding why is this increase in costs and the value of the dollar and, and um, no controls over their costs. I personally, and, and others have agreed with me, that there is corruption in the HQIU. There's a bias there. Um, and so that needs to be resolved. And the ALJ, look, when I went to my hearing, the ALJ had no problems in mocking my ethnic hair. Oh, yes, she did. And did anyone object? No. No, not at all. Um, and you, what you're paying is for the AL. I can go on and on. So in any event, um, I would also agree that um, when you, and as you know, a, a physician. Some, yes, thank you. Um, the, the point made about the increase in uh, cost of licensing and renewal will definitely decrease the number of physicians who are going to seek renewal. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have two people bothering. Okay. Shade Gibson. Uh, this is an idea that I've talked about maybe 25 years ago. Um, I never got a satisfactory answer, and that has to do with the increased use of the letters of reprimand as a way to not only perhaps reduce the, the need to recover costs for prosecutions or, or disciplinary actions, but also to perhaps reduce the number of instances, kind of like we heard about earlier, about doctors that are prescribing hundreds of, of narcotics that 
um, a, a letter of reprimand is a public uh, document and uh, with your new app that you can check on your doctor or, or whatever your licensed person is, if, if the public knows that a doctor is, um, that his, his or her care has been kind of problematic, that might help to, re to give them, him or her a reason to do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. How come nobody questions why all of a sudden you're going to be insolvent? No fee increases for 14 years, but just now, out of the blue, you're figuring out you're going to be insolvent? That sounds like executive mismanagement of the budget. Is that Kimberly Kirkmeyer's fault? Remember, too, this board seems to be incapable of processing any more than a 4% disciplinary rate. You're closing 96% of 11,000 complaints that come in, and you're on the brink of insolvency. If you all found your scruples and started really protecting the public, it would cost you way more money than you're looking to attain here. So accepting this reserve amount is essentially accepting that it's appropriate to close 96% of the consumer complaints because that's all the money you're seeking. And finally, I remain that doctor fees funding the medical board creates an automatic conflict of interest. And it is clear that it comes into play with your abysmal disciplinary rate. And these fees aren't particularly high that they're, you're seeking. In comparison, initiation fees to join SAG after the actor's union the, is $3,000 just for initiation. And then they pay 1.57% of their annual uh, income on work dues. And most doctors make way more than most of the actors in this country. Perspective, figure out 1.575% of a doctor's salary and see how much that comes out to. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones. Dr. Gonadev. Uh, reluctant to high. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus. Aye. Ms. Lawson. Aye. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. No. Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Mr. Watkins. Aye. And Ms. Pines. Aye. Okay, the motion carries. Okay, moving to the next item, um, which is item eight. An update from the Attorney General, Ms. Castro. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the Department of Justice Chief of Division of Operations, Chris Ryan, who's accompanied me here today, just in case. Um, anything arises that you need answered. Um, the AG represents our clients uh, to the best of our ability and we support them in all of your goals to enforce the laws effectively and efficiently. Uh, today, uh, Christine Lawley asked us to please present on the packet, in your board packet you will find um, the 312.2 report. And so I'm going to start some of my remarks by briefly discussing this report. And I also brought copies of the prior two reports and a flowchart in case anybody had any further questions. This report is one of three reports required as an overall statutory scheme enacted by the legislature. The first part uh, report that goes in the statutory scheme is Business and Professions Code Section 312. That relates to an annual report that is required of the Department of Consumer Affairs for three metrics for each of their constituent agencies. The second report, memorialized in Business and Professions Code Section 312.1, which became effective on January 1st, 2015, requires the Office of Administrative Hearings to report on four metrics. And finally, the third report, and the one that is most relevant to me, 
and the Attorney General's Office is the Business and Professions Code Section 312.2. That legislation became effective January 1st, 2016, and it is the third of three legislatively mandated reports. The legislature required the Office of the Attorney General to report on 13 metrics for each of the DCA constituent agencies served by the Attorney General's Office, and that includes you. The licensing section, which is my counterpart at the Attorney General's Office, and I share about 32 clients. And that is uh, what is before you in your handout. It has every single client agency listed and um, similar metrics being applied to each of those different client agencies. And the report really only shows half of our work. The work that is represented in this report is what the legislature really wanted to hear from us to report. It reflects the number of accusation matters received and the number of accusation matters adjudicated in a relevant fiscal year. So if you take out your report, you will see that the last measure in table one is A7. A7 is the number of accusations adjudicated in the relevant fiscal year. If you look at table A1, that represents all of the accusations referred to our office uh, for review. A1 corresponds with uh, part of one of the tables in your fee study report, and that was at page 14. It only discussed accusations received, so A1 is similar to that. But again, the report only reflects half of the work that we do for you. So currently, 50% of the HQE work that we do on behalf of the medical board are accusations, and the data is based on metrics and milestones and information, such as documents um, valid, validating each milestone. So in fiscal year 2018 to 2019, as you can see from A7, we adjudicated 390 accusations on your behalf. Of these, 14% went to hearing, which for a total of 56 cases. 9% of the total, or 34 cases, were managed by default. We stip uh, obtained stipulated outcomes, so that would include stipulated probation or stipulated surrender in 73% of your cases for a total of 285 cases. And we withdrew, which is a very rare uh, event, but 4% of cases were withdrawn for a total of 14. What these metrics reflect to you is that our DAGs are doing an amazing job in moving these cases and achieving great outcomes. Although the report does not go into the outcomes, I would like to share that the trend right now, according to this report, is in about 34 to 37% of the cases that you, we adjudicate per year result in a revocation of the license or a surrender of the license. And with that, um, I'll conclude that part of the presentation of the report, and if you have any questions on it, I'm happy to answer. Can, can I start? I have some questions. So, um, Ms. Castro, it looks like I think we your mic have mic sort microphone. of differing data, um, and I'm wondering if perhaps our offices can get together to rectify the differences in the data that we have for the same years you're reporting in number of cases that have um, gone to you versus the number of cases that you're showing here. Um, so there's, there seems to be just some data, some data that's a little bit off. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can get together and, and sort of rectify it. It's not, you know, major, but you know, it's, a, you know, fluctuating around 15, maybe 17, 18 cases of each year. Most certainly, uh, we welcome that. And okay. in fact, um, the Senate and Assembly Business and Professions Committee have um, in the past recommended to DCA that this these reports be looked at mm -hmm. and that um, certain conclusions be drawn from it um, with working with each of our client constituent agencies. So we're certainly more than open to talk about what the starting points are, how we measure those, and to the extent you want it to you know, marry or at least understand how we're collecting the data, that would be great. Um, of course, that's with the understanding that at this point, we're already started collecting data for three years. 
the two sections have already agreed on how we're going to line up licensing and all 32 of our clients. So it'll be uh, kind of a conversation of this is how we're doing it. And if it's a plus or minus 10, uh, I would, we would probably be comfortable with it if it was accusations received. But if it's a much smaller class of cases, then obviously we need to look at it. Okay. Um, and again, the legislature had um, to pinpoint. So again, I want to stress that A1 on this report reflects what is coming in. And so those would be investigations coming into the Attorney General's office, um, which we may eventually uh, marry into one accusation. So th that number will not match your number of accusations. It'll match the number of completed investigations. So that was 604. Um, that does not mean that those are 604 accusations that you filed. These are 604 individual investigations that you marked and sent to us. Whether we condensed the four investigations into one accusation or grabbed a new accusation and amended an existing accusation. Um, but number seven does represent unique distinctive matters of 389. And below table two represents each of the metrics um, that are being measured pursuant to the request of the legislature. And I'm proud to say that for the complexity of the cases and the litigious nature of them and the difficulty in uh, reconciling expert opinions uh, when it's a battle of the experts type of situation, together with resources and our uh, vigor uh, with which we look at these cases and make intelligent and thoughtful conversations with you and our stipulation, stipulated um, recommendations to, um, to you to adopt our settlements, these, this data is excellent um, for what we do. We also took care to um, the Attorney General, uh, who, who has a uh, CGIS, uh, the Justice Information Service Bureau, um, works closely with us in putting this data together. So at the preface, you will see different um, information explaining to you what happened in that year and conclusions at the end and the explanation of terminology. And this is a top-notch report. We also took care to explain to you the mean, the median, and most importantly, the standard deviation. Because in actuality, averages don't mean anything unless you know uh, the whole body of the case. Uh, universe that we had that year. So a standard deviation will tell you how squishy that bell curve was, whether there were outliers in that particular universe that may have skewed some of the uh, results. And most importantly, I think with all data, is to give you a sense of the count. So if we had 383 cases um, being measured versus seven, then you will understand that perhaps if uh, a case was re referred to us and we had seven cases, when you're looking at that average, we're talking about an average for seven cases. And so if that average is you know, something you want to discuss and see exactly which of those seven cases there were, we could probably figure that out for you. Um, and like I said, I brought the data for all three years. I can leave uh, th just those sheets in the back and give them to Mary Kate to distribute to you. And then we have a flow chart that we have provided in the past, but it actually explains to everyone the voluminous amount of work. And um, I love charts. I loved flow charts in particular. Not everybody does. But it, it really shows all the different uh, due process um, steps that have to be taken to be able to allow the government to remove a property right from a doctor, as it should be. Um, so we're happy to talk about anything in this report. But we can, probably can't change how we measure these things at this point, is my point. Okay. Um, Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Castro, for being there. At least uh, I couldn't drag you before for the item before, but. I saw you wanted to. But. <laughs> no, I did. So you know me, I don't quit. Um, how did we go from $12 million in 1819 to $21.4 million in 24, 25, when the vertical enforcement was even eliminated in the sunset. So I'm just trying to figure out how we can get there. W would you let me know what you're looking at, sir? Uh, the numbers 
from uh, what uh, the last presentation gave, what the AG thought. What, what page? It's in my oh, summary, the findings? Yeah, CPHR consulting oh, study, second page. The, other the PowerPoint. Yeah, they have it. So, we just have the report. Yeah. So, the the re so the report is what we're looking at? Yeah, second page, uh, Gloria. So it's, okay, uh, so. And second item number two. Finding number two? Yeah. You're, look, you're looking at the. If you're looking at the PowerPoint, got, I don't no, have looking it. At the same thing you are. I think um, Dr. Gananadev is referring you know, in the report. It's page 20. Okay. So it's um, showing the actual current budget and future years, the projected budgets. Okay. So what's your question again, sir? How did we go from $12 million in 1819? and to projected budget of $21.4 million in 24-25, when even, unfortunately or fortunately, we don't know what it is, vertical enforcement is gone. So that's why all this increase in budget, what is it for? So to speak to the, uh, the report, um, again, we got it this morning. Uh, so uh, we had some time to review it this morning before we got here. Um, the AG rate had not been increased for 10 years. So just to give you a little bit of history as to how we got to the, the rate of 220. Um, again, my name is Chris Ryan. I'm the Chief of Operations for the Department of Justice. <laughs> and we worked with the Department of Finance and uh, prepared a report as to justify the, the hourly rate of 220 for the, the new rate that began in September. Um, that report went to the legislature. It was a, a public process. So now coming back to this report and to your question of how do we go from $12 million in 1920 uh, to the 21, uh, my assumption is that this is based on the number of hours anticipated to be worked in the, in the future and a, a rate of a certain amount. But again, I don't have the details behind these numbers. Um, the 12 million uh, there uh, is probably the new rate, um, but currently the, the new rate is not being paid by the board. Um, so that would not have an impact on expenditures today, but it would have an impact on the expenditures in the future. Um, so again, I, I would have to see some more detail, but it's likely a number of the volume of, of hours being worked at a, at a particular rate. And, and Dr. Gananadev, uh, perhaps you don't know this, but we were not consulted on this, so I, we really are uh, guessing as to what this meant, but it's a calculated guess. Um, and to your point of, well, VE went away, so you know that was a $1.9 million a year program. And once that goes away, um, you still are going to see expenses just because you get rid of us being in, invest in 1,800 investigations. We're still going to see the amount that's coming in, which I just told you is a third, 600. So if we're not looking at the investigations and vertical enforcement, when they arrive at my office, well, I'm going to assign that case to a DAG for legal review, and he or she is going to make a decision of whether there's enough evidence or not. And um, he or she will either accept the case for prosecution, accept it with conditions, meaning we need more evidence. I'll, I'll file this, but we also need that to make this a good case, or just completely send it back. And on the point of billing, when we do that, when we send a case back, we either reject it outright because the statute of limitations is, has expired or we send it back because there's not enough evidence to sustain our clear and convincing to a reasonable certainty burden of proof, we close our case, so we stop billing on that case. So even though there would have been a savings had n nothing happened, the work still would have been there anyway, so it wasn't, wouldn't have been a, a savings of 1.9 million in my opinion. My, my point to bring it up was that you are our partner, so work with us and really keeping the cost down. We can't just be increasing the revenue without controlling costs. That's the main reason why I'm pointing out all these costs. Uh, so one of them is yours, and I'm glad to see both of you there. You're good friends, too. So. Dr. Krause? I assume you have relationships with all of the DCA boards, although in different capacities. Um, 
So I'm honored to represent seven other clients at DCA. So, so, so I'm interested to know with those other clients who are DCA boards, uh, if we're the number one utilizer, mm -hmm. but I'm also interested to know if you look at that per capita, you know, we've got 100,000 licensees or more, uh, and some boards may have only 10,000 licensees. Are we the number one utilizer per capita licensee or you know, I'm looking at our expenses and ways of, okay. of understanding why we have such a high AG expense. So I can answer half of the question and then Chris Ryan will hopefully answer the other half. The first half of the question is you don't have to guess. You have a fancy little report that we put into here. So every single agency at this at the Department of Consumer Affairs is listed here. So you don't have to guess. We take the number of licensees that they have and list them up at the top. We describe whether or not that licensing agency has a statute of limitations. In the front part, we describe whether they have uh, cost recovery. Uh, we also describe what their burden of proof is. Believe it or not, some licensing agencies don't have a high standard of proof. They have a preponderance of the evidence and they lose their license. So those are different factors that I think this report does an excellent job at explaining from your own data, um, all that. Now, uh, with respect to the medical board, the medical board has regulates 157,441 licensees. And um, what this report tried to do, I think, and again, this is just a, a speculation at this point, but page 14 discusses accusation, it says investigations refer to attorney general's office, but what it should really say is accusation cases refer to the Attorney General's office. But page 14 is missing the number of cases I've been working on. So this is new work per year, but not the work that was already there, which is double this. And if accusations are half of my work, you can guess what the other half is. A big significant part of the work is civil litigation and other services to the board, such as me being here. Um, my staff that was here earlier today um, are, you know, discussing enforcement cases with you, and I, we take pains to find savings, whether it's to assign a case to the most experienced person who's not going to have to learn it or reinvent wheels and who's excellent at a particular subject matter, to another thing that I do on my own. I, if somebody's already coming before you to do a noticed hearing, we ask them, hey, will you do this step? It brings one dag up to do three. That's why you stopped seeing so many DAGs, but that was, uh, that was something I did on my own. I thought it would save costs, and I did that on my own. Um, but on the second part of your question is the, the usage of the big, the big uh, LSRF. Yeah, I, I wouldn't speak to the per capita, but I can say that these cases tend to be more complicated than some of the other boards and bureaus that are out there. And so what we see in the in the spreadsheets are that there are more hours consumed. Uh, so that you know drives the cost and, and the bill coming to the medical board. So hope that answers your question. But the, the other thing I would follow up with is to the extent that you bear the brunt of our process. Uh, and that our process itself sometimes engenders extra hours. Uh, it would be helpful for us to find a means of collaboration for you to advise us in terms of how expensive our processes are uh, and how much expense are we incurring to make small changes in stipulations uh, so that we can keep that in perspective. Uh, and for you to advise the board as to what we might do to contain expense other than asking you to spend less. Sure, we could we could work with staff to figure out the, the best way of uh, providing that feedback, and uh, it could be included, I assume, in a future you know report, uh, or just an ongoing collaboration with the staff uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, you know, I have a, just a com this is just a comment, and so when you look at like effectiveness, like from our standpoint, when we send over like something we believe is ready and fully capable of, you know, being prosecuted. In our perspective, we believe like 100% of that should move forward. From your perspective, what do you think that percentage should be? So from the accusations that we refer to you, 
right? What do you think like your effectiveness of, of getting those cases actually adjudicated should be? Just in your mind, like what do you think that percentage should be? Well, we don't have to guess because it's in our report. We actually tell you in total how many of those cases are returned to you. So No, uh, I, I, no I totally hear it, but what do you think? If we think 100%, I'm asking you, what do you think, like, from an effectiveness standpoint, like, that should be? I hear what you're saying. The numbers are here about you, the bounce backs. Right, for, for the entire body of it. I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, we have what, what happens. And in September of 2019, uh, we referred a letter to the Department of Consumer Affairs at their request to give them feedback on improvements to... Department of Investigations, uh, investigative uh, practices. The licensing section and the health quality enforcement section got together, and we wrote this letter to the Department of Consumer Affairs, to Brian Clifford, and they received our recommendations of, we don't like to call it best practices, because obviously investigative methods change, um, departures from the standard of care can evolve, so it's not a frozen kind of thing, but just good practices. Uh, get certified documents, do this, do that. And so it was a letter that we sent at their request uh, to try and improve the process because Ms. Pines are right. I mean, if they send a case, we should be able to file it, mm -hmm. but we don't, and we know we don't, and that's, a, that's in the report. So mm -hmm. that's a, a matter for further discussion. Okay. Are there any other questions from board members? No? Okay. Is that the end? Uh, did you have another part? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. real quick. Okay. okay. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I would really encourage the board to, to look at the report and, and read it and, and also see all three years of it. And like I said, I, I brought the sheets from the prior two years so you could kind of like line them up if you wished and um, the flow chart. Um, just real quick, I have, we have a couple of new staff members that joined um, the Health Quality Enforcement section. Dag Hamza Murthy, uh, who received her law degree in 2010 and engaged in private practice for five years and eventually joined the California Supreme Court Ethics uh, Council in practice, uh, joined the Attorney General's Office in the Health Education and Welfare section two years ago and I promptly um, was able to attract her to our section. So welcome to Ms. Murthy. She comes with a deep uh, level of civil litigation and defense expertise. I'd also like to welcome Lynette Hecker. She's, a depart uh, she's in our Fresno office, and she, after working in medical malpractice in the early part of her career, spent about uh, 20 years working with U.S. District Court judges in Fresno and the District Court. And so she comes with, to us with a lot of uh, federal court experience. And so um, my hires are thoughtfully made, not only for the people that want to do this work, which there are many, but also for the talents that they bring that help me serve you in the most efficient way possible. And I know that I won't have to teach uh, Hamza how to defend you. She already knows how to do it, and Ms. Hacker knows how to bang out a 12B6 motion, and she did so, and it got, you know, th it got dismissed with, with prejudice, which is unusual for a federal court. Um, but, she, yeah, she did it, so um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Okay. Are there any comments from the public in the audience? So uh, maybe what was not uh, discussed in great detail is the cost of um, cases. So certainly when um, a case is brought uh, before the AG and it's gone to hearing or doesn't go to hearing, it becomes settled, um, that's kind of what's in her report. But what's not in the report is when there is a bias. When for some inexplicable reason um, there, a case is brought to the um, AG's office and it's not pursued when in fact it looks like it's an open and shut case. Uh, we, we suggest that it's due to a bias. And so um, in the case of our um, cases, uh, we see, and 
it seems that um, the court is agreeing with us insofar as that um, there's the first case that was filed in Eastern uh, District Court two years ago, and it's still ongoing. And it, um, there was a, a decision that was reached by the um, magistrate, uh, but then suddenly it was referred to a different magistrate. So um, in any event, um, we postulate that there is a significant bias that occurs in the AG's office and that in fact, more money is needed by them to, um, to continue to push through cases that um, represent their bias, that there is some type of inexplicable bias against a certain physician. Maybe they're not hospital affiliated, maybe they're a whistleblower, that in fact the AG wants to push through and that's why it's costing so much time and so much money. And when those cases are pushed through, and they revoke a license, um, and that results in multiple federal civil rights lawsuits, that's where a lot of the money is going to. And so we um, do not agree with the AG's decisions and feel that um, utilizing an outside um, law firm could probably cut costs. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the public? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay. Moving to the next agenda item, which is uh, item number nine, an update from the Health Quality Investigation Unit, Ms. Chris and Ms. Nichols. Good afternoon. My name is David Chris, and I'm the chief of the Department of Consumer Affairs Division of Investigation. And this is uh, Deputy Chief uh, Kathleen Nichols. We'll be providing an update on the division's Health Quality Investigation Unit, uh, including a uh, hiring clearance that we just received. HQIU currently has five investigator vacancies, which is a 6% vacancy rate. Out of the five remaining vacancies, four have been given uh, conditional uh, employment offers and should clear the psychological and medical portions uh, of the background soon. Uh, taking into account the conditional offers, there is only one remaining investigator vacancy, uh, 0 0.01 vacancy rate. There are nine candidates in background for this one vacancy. All candidates in the background uh, have completed their post academy already. With the passage of uh, Senate Bill 425, uh, HQIU is anticipating a significant increase in investigation referrals. SB 425 requires a mandated report to the medical board if a health facility or entity receives a written complaint regarding sexual abuse or sexual misconduct. A BCP was approved to add an additional 11 sworn positions to HQIU to uh, address this increased workload. Uh, and five positions are slated for July 1st, 2020, and the remaining six on January 1st, 2021. And we are conducting hiring panels to select uh, the remaining candidates so that their backgrounds can be cleared by the times the positions are awarded. Uh, as we discussed at the last board meeting, we have additional staff uh, working on a task force to assist with the pending workload. The task force has already completed 37 investigations and is currently assigned to uh, uh, assigned 144 active investigations. We are focused on reducing the timelines for all investigations and have implemented a new case monitoring plan. Uh, supervisors will be conducting case reviews every month with investigators on every case uh, and updates will be entered into the Breeze system so clients can view the progress of investigations every month. We have implemented a statewide case review outlook calendar to track the monthly case reviews and command staff will be ensuring that all cases uh, are progressing appropriately. Uh, DFI has also gone through an extensive review by the department's organizational improvement office to identify areas to streamline processes and reduce workload and timelines. An official report is being prepared uh, by the OIO office and it should be released within the next couple of months. 
We've been working with uh, the board and uh, board staff and DCA's executive office to implement these streamlining efforts as soon as possible. And we'll have more specific updates to share at the next board meeting. We also have some slides. Uh, the first slide that's uh, displayed shows HQIU closed case averages by month and fiscal year, which includes medical board case processing time. Uh, this second slide breaks down uh, the closed case averages by case type. And this uh, next slide, we wanted to share uh, the numbers of cases that are referred to HQIU uh, each fiscal year for investigation. Uh, as you can see, with, with the exception of fiscal year 1819, the number of investigation referrals has been steadily increasing. This fiscal year to date, HQIU has received 800 investigation referrals. With the year half over, if we keep receiving investigations at the same pace, that uh, would put the fiscal year 1920 total at 1,600 investigations, which is a 500 uh, plus case increase from the year fiscal year 1415 uh, with the same number of investigative staff. The, Next slide, uh, which is actually good news, is uh, we've been steadily increasing the number of investigations completed. Uh, the slide shows HQIU's case completion over fiscal years. <laughs> fiscal year 15-16 was the height of our vacancy cr uh, crisis. As you recall, that was uh, around 40%. Uh, since that time, HQIU has increased productivity in each fiscal year. And last fiscal year, 1819, HQIU completed over 1,400 investigations. Uh, this next slide uh, that we wanted to share with you depicts a comparison to the number of cases HQIU receives and completes in the average completion time. Our ability to complete as many cases as we receive directly impacts the closed case average. And during the fiscal years 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17, 18, HQIU received more cases uh, than we completed. And this added to the pending workload. With the vacancies filled in uh, uh, fiscal year 18, 19, HQIU was able to complete more cases than we received, which is uh, good news. And by continuing with this trend, we will be able to reduce the pending workload and reduce the closed case average. And uh, that concludes our update, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Lewis? Yes. Um, I'm glad you've um, added some more graphs to your presentation. Finally. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble um, reading um, two of them. Okay. So if I read the first one and I look at 1920, in July I see it went from 507 to 613 average days to complete an investigation. Back on that slide. Then I look at um, the one that you have the the V investigation yes. completed. I see fourteen hundred for eighteen nineteen. What? Oh, on eighteen nineteen it says fourteen seventeen, and on your other graph, which I. Tell me if I'm confused about this. They're called the same thing. I see 507, and then it goes to 613 for 1920. Am I reading that correctly, or is it not labeled? Right. I, I'm this confused. first slide is closed case averages. That's the averaged, um, average number of days for a closed case. This slide here, which refers to the 1,400 that were done in 1819, that's the actual number of investigation completions. This slide right here doesn't, doesn't discuss age. It's talking about how many we've completed each year. Okay, so what's the, um, what's the change, the delta? Um, how many, what, what percentage each year are you completing? That should be more and more each year, correct? Well, with this last slide, what it shows is that for several years in the middle, 
where we weren't able to complete as many cases as we took in, that added to the aging of the case, which you see on the first slide, you know, where it talks about what the average days are. But the trend is, is that in this last year, we were able to complete more cases than what we received, um, which means that if when this trend continues, that closed case to average will go down. down. I just don't see it here. It's a little hard for me to see it visually. So, but thanks for that. Uh, you, you were, Kathleen, you were going to say something else. I was just going to say that as we get through the pending workload, which is all the extra cases that were kind of piling up in those three years, we still prioritize and handle the most urgent cases first. So some cases we're closing now were older and it affects the closed case average. So sometimes it appears that things are getting worse when they're actually getting better. Okay, thank you. Oh, Dr. Ganana Dev and then Ms. Lubiano. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chris and Ms. Uh, um, I'm looking at again the budget. Uh, I see the numbers. I'm hoping that you were, you were 19, 20 will it will trend down one of these days. It, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, at least your other curve shows that you closed number of days, so it, a number of cases, so it might start trending down. But your budget goes from $19.6 million in 1819 to $28.3 million in 24-25, which is a 44.3% increase. So yes. is that your budget and how you, going to, how you came up with it? And, uh, what do we do if we don't have money to pay you? So the, um, the, the largest things that affected that are the collective bargaining, and, and that's, that's out of our control. No, so those are our are, are wages. And then the, the, the other additional thing was um, SB 425 and the uh, legislation requiring the mandated uh, reporting from facilities, and then that, um, Necessitated in uh, will necessitate in future um, um, additional positions uh, to be added to uh, investigate that workload that's anticipating when it comes. Okay, so it's a two prong hit for our budget. One is collective bargaining, I understand that, and second one is you're expecting more cases to do, so you need more staff. Is that what you're? Thank you. Yes, and also with respect to the pay raises, as you recall, we have been pushing for these pay raises for many, many years in the past, and that's what led to a lot of the vacancies and the big crisis we had was because the pay wasn't comparable. So the contract is actually a very good thing. These increases, although I know it increases the budget, but it would help us with the retention so that we're not turning over staff. Any other, uh, Dr. Hawkins? Sure. How are oh. we doing retention? With this meeting we have, we're doing it without So how are we doing retention? Each uh, yeah. board meeting we hear, uh, boy, we got this many vacancies, and so. Yeah, so, so this, I'm uh, happy to report uh, that this is the best, our, or the lowest vacancy rate we've had in a, a very long time, and uh, we have a whole, um, number of additional people in background to fill those positions and to me that shows interest interest in this type of work um, that the the wages are more appropriate for the for the type of work and people uh, want to have these jobs and want to stay so I mean that's that's the way it's looking and trending so we are very excited about that are you seeing the skill set that you think you need yes absolutely um, some of our new investigators are extremely talented people super sharp analytical go-getters really empathetic um, have a drive for the mission to protect the public and protect patients and so I'm extremely happy with the new hires that we have um, and also to get to your question of retention you know are we just hiring people but people still leaving I'm pleased to report that the last employee that left um, HQIU, left D of I, that was in March of 19, and it was to go back to their prior agency. They were an SROA hire, so they left to go back to get more money. Um, we did have four employees that left in April of 2019 to go to other D of I programs, but they you know, stayed within D of I. And then uh, most importantly, since that time, other than retirements, not one person has left. 
So can I ask a question just about one of the charts? It's uh, the second chart you showed, the average days to complete investigations. So it's an increase overall, right? So it's an, an increase each year, it's increasing and increasing. And it's pretty, you know, sort of significant increase from, you know, where it was um, in 15, 16. But then there's particular things that are increasing, um, like the prescribing and criminal conviction and crime, which kind of is surprising to me why that one's increasing. What can you just speak maybe to those two? Like, what, what are you seeing? What's happening in investigation to kind of help us understand why the increase in days? Prescribing cases in general are very complex and take mm -hmm. a long time. So that, that's always been the case. And sometimes with a conviction of a crime case, we may get a case, there's charges filed. So we close it initially pending the outcome of the mm -hmm. criminal case. Okay. But when, just say years down the line, they get convicted, the case gets reopened. We get the documents, do what we need to do. We, we complete that case, but then when it gets reopened, it's, you know, the time is added, the original time plus the new time. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, Ms. Lubiano? Just a few questions for clarification on the chart about the number of cases referred. I was wondering referred from whom? This is from medical board and also our allied health clients um, that we also do cases for, but the, the vast majority are all medical board. Got it. And the second question as to the time of completion for the cases, um, do you have any insight as to the speed at which some cases are being completed? For example, uh, do the, does that number represent perhaps more cases, like are, are you completing older ones as fast as you can first before newer ones that are coming in or? Yes, we do focus on age, but even we can't just focus on the oldest cases because some of the new cases that come in are completely urgent or, you know, if it's alleged a doctor's impaired on drugs, you know, a high risk to the public, we kind of have to drop everything and do that. So once those urgent ones are done, yes, we're very actively um, trying to resolve these older cases so that we can bring that number down. Got it, thank you. Okay. Thank you, any thank you. additional questions? Great, thank you. Mr. Chris and Ms. Nichols. Thank you. Okay, do we have any comments from members in the public? Hi, uh, Dr. Ray here. So um, I, I do have a concern when I see the number of cases referred to HQIU for investigation on, um, on this page. You know, when the number, numbers drop from 1,300, 1,500 down to 1,200, it really doesn't justify an increase in, in cost um, if there's a decreased number of cases being referred. So it's just something that might need to be looked into. Um, and also, a, you know, a suggestion as far as cost containment is maybe consider, if you're able to, putting a time limit on investigating a case. If you're not able to close the investigation within 18 months, then, um, then you can't pursue it. I mean, to have cases that are open and being investigated two, three years later, you know, whatever the current, um, uh, you know, timeline is, uh, might be relevant to consider, um, uh, you know, shortening that timeline um, to get a case um, investigated uh, in, in terms of cost containment. I mean, with 11,000 complaints, uh, surely um, it, it's, it, can, it can be an impactful to determine the quality of cases, but in any event, um, it's totally true that um, if you increase the cost of, um, of uh, uh, getting a medical license and that kind of thing, you may see a number of, um, of, of uh, pay, uh, physicians drop. So it's something else to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Great. 
Moving to the next item, which is item 10, discussion and possible action on legislation and regulations. Ms. Simones. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> so the 2020 legislative session has started and the bill introduction deadline is not until February 21st. So we will have many more bills in our next board meeting, but um, this one we only have a couple. So there is also a 2020 legislative calendar in your packets just so you have it so you know when the legislative deadlines are. Um, on your tracker list, if you go to the tracker list tab, there are two bills listed that we will be discussing today. One is a two-year bill that has been recently amended and one is a bill that was just introduced in January. SB 201 is listed on your agenda, but I'll just be providing a short update. Before and we discuss the bills, I would like to provide an update on the legislative proposals you approved at our last meeting. We have four proposals that we have submitted to Senate Business and Professions Committee for inclusion in the committee bill. And these are really just the technical clarifying changes. I have met with staff and answer questions and those proposals are going through the review process. Um, next up update I'd like to provide is on 2020 Legislative Day. I'll be working with Ms. Pines and Dr. Lewis on a time frame for the next Legislative Day likely looking at the end of April or early May. I will then be reaching out to all board members to see if they are interested in participating. And I'll send out a poll to interested members to try to set up a day that works best for everyone. Um, for my update on SB 201, this bill would have prohibited treatment or intervention on the sex characteristics of a person under six, year, six years old unless the treatment or intervention is medically necessary as specified. This bill would have required the medical board to adopt regulations to determine which treatment and interventions are medically necessary. This bill died in Senate BMP committee. However, similar language will likely be introduced in another bill. And if it is, I'll be bringing it to the board at our next board meeting. So now I'll move on to the first bill um, in your, in your um, legislative packets, AB 1909. <clears throat> this bill would prohibit a healing arts licensee from performing an examination or test on a patient to determine whether the patient is a virgin. This bill would specify that a violation of the prohibition would constitute unprofessional conduct and would be grounds for disciplinary action by the appropriate licensing board. According to the World Health Organization, virginity testing has no scientific or clinical basis. Um, the World Health Organization says that there is no examination that can prove a girl or woman has had sex and virginity testing is a violation of the human rights of girls and women and can be detrimental to women and, and girls physical psychological and social well-being. The type of exam that this bill is prohibiting has no scientific or, cl or clinical basis. And for this reason, board staff is recommending that the board take a support position on this bill, but I would need a motion. Are there any comments or questions from members? No? Okay. This is no brainer. Okay. <laughs> Are there any comments uh, from the audience? Any comments on the phone? We do have one on the phone from Allison. Your line is open. Hi, are we discussing SB 201? No. 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 Okay, I'm, I'm waiting to comment on that. Okay. Ms. Cruz Joan, please call the roll. Dr. Ganadev. Yes. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus. Aye. Ms. Lawson. Aye. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Aye. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Mr. Watkins. Aye. And Ms. Pines. Aye. All right. It's okay. Keeping it low controversy. I think we've had enough controversy today. <laughs> Just remember this meeting next time. Okay. So um, the next bill is SB 480. And this bill would require the medical board to establish a radiologist assistant advisory committee. And the purpose of the committee would be to identify the appropriate, the appropriate training qualifications and scope of practice for an individual providing assistance to radiologists. This bill would require the RA committee to be composed of specified members, including two members of the board appointed by the board. <clears throat> this bill would require the RA committee to research and recommend potential statutory changes to grant expanded practice authority to certified radiologic technologists or medical assistants working under the supervision of a radiologist by doing the following. Analyzing the effect effectiveness of medical assistance and the practice of radiologist assistance, determining the appropriateness of specialty medical assistant licensure, determining any necessary revisions to regulations to promote workforce development in the fields and ensure patient access to service services, 
<clears throat> evaluating the regulatory recognition of radiologist assistants in other states if appropriate, <clears throat> and evaluate, evaluating where experiences in military training and experience exist, and where the transfer of skills gained through military service may be utilized <clears throat> in determining the requirements for work in radio, radiographic technology, including as a radiologist assistant and, and in the medical assistant field. <clears throat> This bill would specify that members of the RA committee are required to serve without compensation. And the bill would require the RA committee to submit a report that includes the research and recommendations required by this bill to the board, the governor, and the legislature on or before January 1st, 2022. This bill would require the RA committee to serve in an advisory capacity, but the board and, and, and the California Department of Public Health must adopt regulations to implement relevant recommendations and information contained in the report. This bill would re be repealed on January 1st, 2023. The board has um, put some fiscal costs in there just for additional workload, and it's estimated they'll need a half-time limited term AGPA, and that would be a cost of approximately 57,000 per year just to handle that additional workload. So requiring a new advisory committee in the board to research and identify the scope of practice for individuals providing assistance to radiologists is not an appropriate function for the board. The board currently does not look at the scope of individuals who provide assistance to any type of physician specialty, and there are many different physician specialty assistants in California that may seek similar legislation if this bill were to pass. The board already has regulations in place for medical assistants who can provide technical and supportive services to all physicians. In addition, the board does not have oversight over any radiologic health licensees. These individuals are currently licensed by the California Department of Public Health's radiologic health branch. It may be confusing for the board to take the lead on radiologist assistance while the California Department of Public Health has oversight over all other radiologic health licensees. For these reasons, staff is recommending that the board take an opposed position on this bill, but I would need a motion. So um, are there any comments? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Gananadev? Just a question. Uh, actually, why did this even come about? Because there, is, there are radiology right. technicians which are under public health licensees. Right, so we've had this issue before, like, an I don't know if you guys remember, but anesthesiologist assistants looked for, like, a, a pa licensure pathway. This bill originally would have been a licensure pathway for radiologist assistants, and really the reason is usually expanded scope, and they can make more money if, they're, if they have actually a license. So this bill... You know, it, went, it got held, it became a two-year bill. Committee, um, when it was in committee, they kind of said, you know, that's going too far, but here make it like, you know, a lot of times make it a study or have a, a committee to look at it and do a report. So that's kind of how it got in this form. But just thinking of like all the other assistant type for specialty practices that would come to us if this were to pass um, could be daunting. And there's a lot of different specialties that use assistance. We already have medical assistants that can help any kind of physician. So this is kind of a slippery slope kind of item and that's why I'm suggesting we oppose it. For the annual legislative day, I'm wondering if perhaps uh, the medical board may consider, uh, you know, having some patient advocates come along. Maybe not. Um, certainly, it would um, it would be something to consider um, of benefit. Uh, we're looking forward to um, the interested parties meeting uh, to see if uh, what you know how beneficial that would be. So um, that's just something to maybe uh, consider. Thank you. Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Aye. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Okay. And that Next. concludes my legislative presentation. That's it? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Be happy. Be happy. Jennifer, <laughs> yeah. It's the bill introduction yeah. deadline isn't yet, so. <laughs> it's a record. Okay. You've got another report for us, the status of uh, yeah, next item 10B. 10B, which is the status of pending regulations, and I'm just here to answer any questions the members might have. I, I do want to say on the 
AB 2138 regulations that we had to do regarding substantial relationship and rehabilitation criteria for um, revoking uh, a license or denying a license. We did have individuals who asked for a hearing. We held the hearing last week. No one came to provide comment. There were no written comments submitted. And so we will be moving forward with the final statement of reasons and getting that off to DCA for approval to submit to the Office of Administrative Law for review. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Any comments from the audience? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay. Um, let's move to agenda item 11, presentation on telehealth. Please come forward, Mr. Marson, Dr. Marson, and Mr. Sometimes. <laughs> Before Dr. Marson begins his presentation, um, I would like to just introduce him briefly. He is currently professor and vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Davis School of Medicine and the director of the Center for Health and Technology at UC Davis Health. <coughs> Dr. Marson conducts research in telehealth related to access, quality of care, particularly as it relates to acutely ill and injured children in rural and underserved communities. Welcome. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. I've never been to one of these meetings and I'm learning a lot. I'm, learning <laughs> I, um, I'm glad that I work where I work and I don't have to wear the suit every day. Um, and I guess lawyers make a lot more money than um, I do. So anyways, I, thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk. And again, what I was asked to do um, was to give an overview of telemedicine, telehealth, um, kind of touch on the anticipated future of telemedicine and what physicians or clinicians should know about telemedicine, particularly related in the state of California. There's lots of definition of telemedicine. You'll hear the term telemedicine, telehealth, digital health, remote patient monitoring, um, mobile health, lots of different applications like that. We like to consider it all under one umbrella and a, a very simple definition adopted by most institutions relates to healthcare provided over a distance using some sort of telecommunications technology. There are typically four bins of telemedicine or um, telehealth. One has to do with live interactive video conferencing, and this is the very common um, quote unquote Skype types of interactions with clinicians and either another clinician with or without the patient or directly with the patient that way. Um, there's another category called store and forward telehealth, which has to do with review of either images um, a, t a classic example of this is with teleradiology or teledermatology where a dermatologist is able to review an image of the skin lesion and our ophthalmologist can review an image of the back of the eye uh, for a diabetic retinopathy um, at, at some later date. There's another category referred to as remote patient monitoring or chronic disease management and this has to do with monitoring um, patients at a distance and this can be both passive and active. Uh, for example, patients with diabetes can have their glucometers monitored, patients with hypertension can have their blood pressure monitored, patients with um, issues with congestive heart failure can have their weights monitored, um, and so on. But it also extends into um, things like your Apple Watch and iPhone that are able to measure your activity. And then another and rapidly emerging category has to do with direct-to-patient or direct-to-consumer telehealth. And this is where folks are able to, patients or consumers are able to access healthcare professionals, including physicians, on their iPhone, on their Android, on their uh, computer, um, this way to be able to get consults from wherever they are uh, to the healthcare provider. Um, the general premise upon which telehealth, I think, is established is, is that um, a lot of expertise is regionalized, typically in bigger cities, like in Sacramento, um, and we, as healthcare providers, know that regionalization and um, helps improve efficiency and quality this way. 
unfortunately, this model of care, while helping efficiency and quality, um, kind of disadvantages those that live um, in rural and underserved communities, as well as those populations that have limited mobility. So the idea is, is that rather than having the patient always have to come to the regional expertise, that the provider and or physician is able to use these technologies um, to reach out to their provider wherever they might be and the patient uh, where they might be. There's lots of data that has been uh, presented and researched to show the opportunities on telehealth can improve the overall quality of care. Um, a common category is access to care. There's, as mentioned, distance barriers, provider shortages, particularly in rural areas, and this is also related to a lack of specialists. As in uh, UC Davis, for example, we have 35 different subspecialty services that we provide um, to rural communities throughout the state through the year. The patient experience is also another uh, commonly referred to um, benefit of telehealth, and this has to do with patient-centered care. It's convenient for consumers. Um, if you're going to need a follow-up uh, conversation with your provider or physician after changing a medication, after discharge from a hospital or having a procedure, sometimes these can be just simply provided over video in the patient's home. And so that's an added convenience of the patient to having to, rather than having to drive in and um, pay for parking and see their provider that way. There's also some studies and data to suggest that this mo these modalities of care can improve the effectiveness of care. Um, if you don't have to room a patient, for example, and um, occupy the space and all of the, the resources that go into it, including the medical assistants and the nurses, if it can be done simply over video, then that's going to be um, an effective use of this technology as long as you're able to provide that a consistent quality, as long as that patient doesn't need to have um, hands laid on to them. And following that, there's lots of data to suggest that costs of care could be reduced by using these technologies. A common, um, a common refer to encounter is somebody with a cold that might otherwise go to an urgent care um, or emergency department might be able to have a phone and or video encounter with a provider and have that issue addressed without having to come to an emergency department. And again, that is thought to help reduce costs. There's lots of different um, areas that it's being used. In general, any way that healthcare is provided, telehealth, mobile health, digital health is being used, outpatient, inpatient, hospital to hospital, urgent cares, video visits, which again are directly to the patient's home, remote patient monitoring, as I mentioned, for those with chronic medical conditions or devices that need to be monitored. It's used in palliative care. I'm a pediatrician, so um, it's being used in schools as well to see children that may not otherwise have access to healthcare, nursing facilities, and of course, to the patient's home. Regarding the future of telehealth, the two most rapidly and anticipated rapidly emerging applications are in this remote patient monitoring or chronic disease management. Um, again, as many of the health um, economic people know, 25% of the population typically uses about 75% of the healthcare costs. And if we're able to use these technologies to help provide care and maintain health among these populations at a lower cost by more proactively monitoring them, then that will hopefully overall uh, save the costs of care. And there's lots of data to suggest this. And these are some of the devices that can be monitored at home. And even communities now are being built with this in mind so that there's motion sensors um, and making sure folks are staying healthy with oximeters and, and devices this way. The other big emerging um, application is, as I mentioned, the direct-to-patient or direct-to-consumer care, the six largest health plans in the country, um, which are collapsing into three maybe, as um, all have access to their patients so that they can contact a physician and or nurse from their device. So it could be from a laptop, tablet, um, or a mobile phone, as well as these uh, large pharmacies are providing these as well. And again, the idea is to have provide convenient 
uh, care these, to these patients and hopefully maintain health before conditions worsen. There are a lot of barriers to the adoption of telehealth, and I would say that the number one is just the workforce issue. When I approach my colleagues and say, hey, you can provide this service to patients or children living in rural areas, they're like, that's wonderful, but I've got a two-month waiting list right now in my in-person clinic. I can't do any more, um, any more visits this way. So it, 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 despite the fact that it can provide these benefits, as I mentioned, the fact is, is that most clinicians are quite busy and just because you're able to do it over the video doesn't mean that they're going to um, adopt it in that matter. Uh, uh, payment parity um, has been an issue and it is an issue uh, with the passage of AB 744 last year and the signing of, by Governor Newsom. So health plans are now paying uh, providers, physicians the same rates as if they were able to see the patient in person as long as that pay, as long as that service can be provided at a safe level right and nobody forces the doctors or the patients to use telehealth uh, if either prefers an inpatient encounter then they can e either side can assist on that this AB 744 relates to um, a lot of the commercial plans and Medicaid, uh, but not Medicare. There's lots of restrictions on Medicare with this still, where the patient's where the patient is. It has to be in a rural site, um, so the use among the Medicaid population is um, quite low. And hopefully, there's legislation in, at the federal level to help um, update those. Um, and again, at FQHCs, rural health clinics, those populations that are um, underserved, there are there's legislative efforts to make, incentivize the use of these technologies um, to increase access in patient care. Um, there's lots of different models of payment. There's fee for service, per clip subscriptions, uh, capitated care, things like that. There's Doctors are always asking about liability and licensure, interstate licensure, which I know um, California, the state of California has its own rules, as do all of the other states. There's a interstate uh, compact for physicians that California does not participate into in, um, and then there's credentialing at the healthcare facilities as well. And all of these are, I think, um, rules and regulations that had been in place before the um, evolution of all of these technologies and so there's a little bit of catching up to do I would say uh, for all of this but again the whole the hard part is, is that clinicians are busy and um, I, that's probably the biggest barrier in my mind why this isn't happening a lot more another thing that physicians I would say no I'm fortunate to work at a health system that um, has multidisciplinary teams that help clinicians do this. There's lots lots to be integrated. You can't just put a webcam on your computer and have your patients um, turn on their mobile phones. It has to be integrated in a clinical operations. There's compliance and privilege and credentialing issues, as I mentioned, whether or not there can be integration with the electronic health record, um, what's going to be happening with this data, make sure that there's nothing recorded, the device technologies, are the FDA approved or not, is the data that you're getting accurate from the devices that are, are even currently available now in pharmacies, um, and lots of legal and regulatory questions that way. So there's a lot of background in a multidisciplinary approach that needs to be implemented before clinicians start integrating this into um, clinical practice. Um, I'm a little bit uh, addicted to um, negative studies in telemedicine. I'll admit that there's this is absolutely taking off the use of telemedicine, all the health plans, all the m major hospital systems, health systems, the University of California, Kaiser, et cetera, all of them are using uh, telehealth and providing these services to their patients. But um, as a telemedicine research, I would say that there's still um, further research that needs to be done. Some of the research um, that I mentioned on the direct-to-patient or direct-to-consumer, for example, the idea is to keep them out of the emergency department and out of urgent care. but some of the research that's been done, including in California, looking at the CalPERS data, shows that that may not necessarily be what's happening, but rather this convenience in, uh, results in actually increased utilization and perhaps even increased costs um, while not providing the same level of care that you would receive in person. So again, caution to this convenient um, getting a doctor on your, on your device. 
And then, of course, AB 744 addressed this, but now health plans have to use the clinicians that are in the patient's own network, which is a good thing, right? Rather than going online and getting a doctor that may have a California license but be living in a different state, um, wouldn't be the provider doing it, but it would be one of your own providers that has access to your own medical record. So this is definitely a threat to the medical home um, if not used properly, but I expect that this will improve. Uh, there's lots of use of the tele-ICU, and again, this is just uh, cherry-picking a study that um, not only did it show any benefit in patient uh, outcomes and mortality or length of stay, but it just increased costs when the Mayo Clinic um, installed these in ICUs because more patients, they requested that they all be transferred to the Mayo. Um, there's another study called the IDEA randomized uh, trial, which looked at congestive heart failure. UC Davis participated in this multi-institutional study where they are monitoring home blood pressure weights, things like that, and didn't find any impact on the outcome or hospitalization or ER visits. Or I'm sorry, that's the BDHF study. The IDEA trial had to do with weight loss. Um, two big populations of patients that were assigned to nutritionists, dietitian interventions um, to help reduce their weight. Half of the population was given um, a, a watch that monitored their steps like a Fitbit. Um, and after two years of this trial, the, both, both cohorts lost um, weight, but it was the cohort that did not have one of these devices that lost more weight. Um, and there's lots of discussion on why that might be, but basically they think that people see, oh, I did my steps today, I can have this donut, which is what I do, and then I threw away my Fitbit. Um, but even though we think that a lot of these technologies are working and which should help patients, um, research needs to be done because that, in fact, did the, the opposite. Um, again, yeah, more research is needed. So again, in summary, and then I, I um, I did give my slides in last week, so hopefully I don't, won't get in trouble for being too late on that. Um, but I did uh, give an updated slide with lots of resources. In California, we're fortunate to have the California um, Telehealth Resource Center. There's 14 of these centers across the country. So we have, and it's located here in Sacramento, and they will offer free services, free advice on how to set these programs up. There's a National Telehealth Policy Resource Center that has to do with legal and regulatory um, matters related to telehealth nationwide, and it is also located here in Sacramento, California. Um, and again, if anybody wants to email me or call me, they're free to do that. And if I can't help you out, then I'm more than happy to point you in the right direction that way. So a uh, summary is that, again, it is patient-centered and uh, more convenient. I think that there's lots of benefit to the use of these technologies. It can be efficient and uh, cost-effective. It can help address population health, man monitoring um, chronic medical conditions, and it can do so passively. Um, so these are, these are great things, um, but there are, even though it sounds great, sometimes we have to study these things and make sure that we're doing the right thing. And in some instances, as I mentioned, with the direct-to-patient or direct-to-consumer, I would submit that they're actual threats to the medical home and care if not um, done properly. Um, and I think that ultimately delivery models or payments need to be changed because right now, as you know, as physicians, we are paid to take care of sick people. We are not paid so well to take care or to keep patients healthy. Um, we get paid more when they're really sick. Um, and so until we're able to shift that paradigm um, with um, more managed care, I think that the adoption, that's another barrier to the adoption is the incentivization uh, for health healthcare facilities because again, we're paid to take care of sick patients. And that's all I have, thank you very much. Dr. Morrison, thank you. I appreciate that. It was very informative. Um, Dr. Thorpe. Uh, thanks, Dr. Morrison. I, um, I'm an internal medicine doc and, and work in Northern California, and was uh, my practice was <coughs> devastated by the campfire, and so most of my many of my patients were scattered throughout the western uh, United States, many of them in California, <coughs> and we were... Um, our my medical group was offered uh, from Blue Shield the opportunity to uh, develop a telehealth platform to try and help us manage those patients. One of the first times that primary care um, the patients are seen in their home, or uh, you know, and they and we 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 help manage that um, tele 
telehealth in that way. And then we also have decided to start using it in terms of follow-up for complex laboratory evaluations and complex testing so that we can actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody about the meaningful things that we're, we're trying to fix. We're also doing RPM um, and chronic uh, care management as well as part of our, our, our general approach to try and improve the population of our, the health of our population. But it, and it, I think the thing that you, what you've said is, is really um, is really key. Right now, um, we're a kind of a pilot project. Blue Shield has been working with us to help us um, actually finance a lot of this that we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. But it's also problematic because uh, it's not sustainable if there's not a, a funding source or a, a payment model that will actually um, pay it uh, for going forward. And I think what you've said about adoption is really true. There is a, why would you um, see a patient on a telehealth visit, even if it only takes 10 minutes, um, why would you substitute a, a, a fee for a three or four level CPT code when you're going to get paid a quarter of that to see the patient on telehealth? And so it's a, it's, there's some challenges in terms of the reimbursement. I'm just basically corroborating what you're saying. As somebody who's trying to find a way to adopt this, this new technology, we're actually using the Teladoc platform, but we've got it um, um, branded um, for our medical group. But mm -hmm. anyway, it's, it, I think it does have some amazing um, potential, but it is uh, right in this very awkward stage of not going, knowing how to go from, you know, where we have the technology and the opportunities to actually getting it to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Very, that very well put. Fair. Yes, I completely agree. Yes. Great, um, Dr. Kraus. Thank you for being here. Thank My pleasure. Uh, personally, I'm a, a fan, a user, and a supporter of telehealth. Um, but uh, putting my medical board hat on. Uh, I don't want to uh, sit idly and wait until there's a consumer complaint, uh, an accusation, or a disciplinary action. Can you think of gaps that we have today uh, on a legislative basis that need to be filled uh, to protect consumers from being taken advantage of by robocallers selling telehealth services or, or anything else that may not be in their best interest and at the same time, other than thinking about what the medical board should do in approaching legislators to protect the public, uh, would you be a, a resource to uh, help us get the word out? Because we're also charged with education, both of consumers and physicians, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> sending out information uh, in our newsletter to advise people of legitimate telehealth services and what to be cautious of in providing or receiving telehealth services? Wow, so that's a lot of questions. And again, I agree with you. There is uh, data to show, as I mentioned, in the direct-to-consumer, direct-to-patient model using um, the platforms that have been mentioned thus far that show that you know they're out to see patients rapidly and they often prescribe antibiotics and medications and they don't adhere to evidence based or HEDIS guidelines even if that if that matters so probably the quality of care slips when it, it's done uh, in a for-profit mode that way um, and I do think that AB 744 address some of that right so the health plans have to now consider their local doctors I've been denied um, payment of seeing a patient um, by a health plan because that health plan contracts out with a for-profit telehealth um, vendor and I have that patient's medical record and I know that patient and they say no 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 we're not going to pay you so I think that laws like that are very important um, to be able to have and say and again I it's very important to uh, protect the consumer there is not a board or a sub board 
of telehealth. Some hospitals and health systems have privileging requirements where they go over safety, etiquette, HIPAA compliance, making sure the patient's in the safety room, in a safe room, that you have a plan B if there's suicidal ideation and things like that. But as mentioned before, we're in our infancy and in learning about this. And so um, I think when I started doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing. I'm going to be able to reach children in rural underserved areas. And then these for-profit companies come out and they start providing these services, not to the rural and underserved, but to those that can have a credit card that can, they can swipe and see a pro, um, professional. So um, academic societies like the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the AMA, are out to try to protect the patient, I think, in my opinion, uh, th this way. So again, I'd love to be a resource with this, and I fully agree, but it's a little bit where um, some of these companies are ahead of the curve on us, and we have to uh, catch up to protect the consumer and the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. Uh, do you think uh, this is a great idea, but do you think that telemedicine would be much more effective and helpful and consolidate in the beginning for preventive medicine instead of acute care medicine? That will basically set up the whole goals and data that so many people are being prevented going to the hospital. Offices cost will come down, patients' pain and expenditure will come down, and uh, probably health plans and Medicare and Medicare might be able to negotiate lesser rate with that thing, and if we can do well in preventive medicine, that will be a Yes, basic absolutely. Step. I think that there are brilliant minds that want to be able to do it. It's just not incentivized this way. And I'll give you an example of diabetes, right? We have the technology. It is easy to be able to monitor how frequently somebody's checking <laughs> their glucose, what it is, things like that. And so right now, the patient has to come in with a glucometer. We hook it up. We download it. We get a few values, and it's too late. If, and so to avoid complications of type 2 diabetes, renal failure, the retinopathy, all of these cardiovascular disease, we can absolutely do a better job at more passive monitoring, but we're not paid to do that, right? So we are, um, who's going to buy these devices for the patients? Who's going to help monitor that? We don't, if we're not paid to do that, we're paid to treat the patients in the hospital to do the ophthalmologic surgeries, to do the renal transplants, to do the amputations, to do the vascular things like that. There, it's a, a, a terrible system where we're paid to um, treat the complications of these diseases as opposed to help keep patients healthy. And I think that the, the payment models will have to, to catch up for us to be able to do that, unfortunately. Interesting. Sorry, I don't mean to, yeah. is, it's a good thing, <laughs> telemedicine. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Dr. Martin? Uh, Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, uh, Dr. Martin, so I, I'm just trying to go a little beyond. Healthcare is the most uh, regulated industry in the country beyond banks, beyond anything else you can think of. So there are direct consumer healthcare companies popping up, whether it is Smile Direct Club or uh, optometry people or uh, feed people or even uh, 23andMe. So where do you think the next step in telemedicine is going to take us to through the uh, gig economy companies? Because any time one of them comes out, their market value is already a billion dollars or more. So uh, I'm just curious what you, if you're involved that much, where, where do you think it's going in spite of the most regulated industry in the country? Mm. I wish I had a really good answer for that. Um, I, would, I would have to say that I think um, because health plans are figuring this out, right? They want to keep their patients more and more healthy rather than they want to keep them out of the hospital. It's just that um, the frontline providers, I think, are not yet incentivized to do that, nor are the hospitals necessarily, unless those patient, that patient population is capitated. Examples are the VA, uh, Kaiser system. They're learning how to use this to keep patients healthy because that dollar saved is a dollar that remains in their pocket. Um, a lot of these um, gig economy and tele, whatever companies, EMD Lab, Teladoc, American Well, Doctor on Demand, all of those companies um, are not necessarily providing services to those entities that I mentioned because I think that um, I would just have to say that they, we have to learn how to better 
keep patients healthy rather than trying to get more money in a fee-for-service world. That's where it is. You provide a service, you get a payment for that. We have to be able to change a paradigm with that. And again, that's a bigger health policy issue than just for telehealth. Okay. Any other? Dr. Lewis? I can just say Dr. Morrison is the person to go in telehealth. So I echo Dr. Krause's request, although you're quite busy, I know. Um, if we need assistance sometime in the future with legislation, would you be available periodically? Sure. So you don't have to commit now, but you may get that phone call. But excellent presentation. I heard during my union um, board meeting, he was there, and I think you did a great job. Thank you for it's, thank you for coming. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any? Yes. <laughs> Are there any comments from the public? And you've got well-behaved kids. I saw them. Yes, hello, uh, Dr. Ree here. So as we all know, I'm revoked in the state of California, but I was recently renewed. My license was renewed in an undisclosed state um, without any problems, and um, it was renewed in Hawaii. And so something like telehealth is excellent. It's, it's the norm. It's been around for 20 years in the state of Hawaii. We're used to it. We depend on it. it it reaches out to, um, you know, people out on um, Kauai, Maui. You know, when the one um, endocrinologist on Maui goes on vacation, it's, it's tough to get another doctor out there. So telehealth is a, a wonderful idea, and it's the norm, and it's usually utilized in Hawaii often. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, somebody left this? I guess. Any other comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay, great. Um, moving to agenda item 12, we were expecting an update from Ms. Forsythe um, from the Physician Assistant Board, but she is not going to be able to join us today. She had an emergency at the office. So we're going to move to agenda item 13, update on the Health Professions Education Foundation, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Gananadev. Dr. Okay. Hawkins. Okay, thank you, and I'll be brief. Uh, the Health Professions Education Foundation met January 8th in Sacramento. Just to remind people of a background, Health Professions Education Foundation, abbreviated HPEF, is a nonprofit 501c3 organization housed in the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, OSHPOD, established to improve access to health care in underserved areas of California by providing scholarship and loan repayment programs to health professional students and graduates graduates who are committed to providing health care service. In return for HPEF support, awarded recipients agree to provide services in medical underserved areas of California for a period of time of one to three years. So the highlights from that meeting was that Scott Sillers resigned as the chairman of the board of HPEF. Governor Newsom will be reappointing someone. HPEF is analyzing recipient survey, surveys to gauge the success of its programs with regard to retention of valid health and physicians under served areas. Uh, expect uh, future updates. Uh, HPEF administers its programs from six funds established by the California State Legislature. However, substantial additional funds are available from the mergers of Cigna, CVS, CVS Health, and the Valuenza Foundation. These funds will increase loan and scholarship for allied health care, advanced practice health care scholarships, and the Stephen M. Thompson Physicians Corps Loan Repayment Program. So Stephen M. Thompson uh, loan application is currently open. Uh, the recurring awards up to $105,000 in exchange for three years in a medically underserved area of California. The deadline for the application is February 21st. 5 p.m. Again, the deadline is February 21st at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, HPEF scholarship application cycle open in January 2nd for allied health care, advanced practice, nursing, and vocational nurses. 
deadline for students to apply is February 25th, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So for more information about HPEF, including applications, please visit and refer candidates to the HPEF website. Okay, thank you. Are there any, Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> yeah, just to add a little, since uh, Prop 56 passed and those funds came through for the uh, scholarship program, uh, Cal Health Care's program pays up to $300,000 in loans, and you have to commit certain, and it's for any specialties. Compared to Steve Thompson loan repayment program pays so $105,000 only for primary care. So the number of applications for the program went down, so we need to encourage people so there were there are actually less than allowable applications for this year at HPEF compared to there are 900 applications at Cal Health Cares for I think about 150 scholarships. So we need to put that info in our newsletter or to the doctors. I'm trying to, I'm getting it to all my primary care people because they can apply for both. If they get the Cal Health Care, they don't have to take the HPEF scholarship. So there is a way to do because you don't want to, this is our money, my majority of the money there is what we pay in the license fee for the scholarship. Some of it is from the uh, settlements with Cigna and uh, Aetna. So, so let's make sure to send it to the physicians, especially young people who just finished, if we can. They, if they have loans anywhere from $100,000 to $500,000, something will help. The only thing they need to commit is three to five years, three years with this one, five years with the Cal Health Cares, that they are going to stay taking care of these people. Great. Any other comments? Or I, I just wanted to say we do have information on um, the main page of the website, mbc.ca.gov. So for anybody tuning in on the webcast, um, all the information and applications are there. Are there any comments from the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Okay, well the board will adjourn today um, and we will return tomorrow at 9 a.m.